Hello, and welcome to the first Protestant Catholic debate in San Jose, California. Tonight, the proposition that will be debated is the following. Did Mary, the mother of Jesus, have other children? Taking the affirmative to this proposition is Professor Eric Spencer. Taking the negative to the proposition is Professor Jerry Matatix. In most Protestant denominations today, there is a general consensus that Mary had other children from the results of normal conjugal union with her husband, Joseph. The Catholic position is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of her son, and remained so until her death. Both Professor Svensson and Professor Manitix will use sacred scripture to support their positions. Now let me introduce the participants. Professor Svensson was a former Roman Catholic who has renounced Roman Catholicism and is now an evangelical Christian apologist. He is co-founder and director of New Testament Restoration Ministries, an organization designed to restore New Testament beliefs and practices to the church. Professor Svensson holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Tennessee Temple University and a Master of Arts degree in New Testament Studies from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He is currently writing his doctoral dissertation for a PhD from Columbia Evangelical Seminary, where he is also an adjunct professor of biblical studies. He has authored several books, including The Table of the Lord and Evangelical Answers, a critique of modern Catholic apologetics. Professor Jerry Matatix is a former Presbyterian minister from the Presbyterian Church of America who has become a Roman Catholic apologist. Jerry Maddox is the founder and president of Biblical Foundations International Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that demonstrates to Catholics and non-Catholics alike the scriptural case for Catholicism. Professor Maddox attended Phillips Exeter Academy, the University of New Hampshire, graduating Phi Beta Kappa, magna cum laude. He received his Master's of Divinity from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and did all his dissertation for a Ph.D. in Biblical Interpretation from Westminster Theological Seminary. He currently serves as a full-time professor of Sacred Scripture and Apologetics at Our Lady of Guadalupe International Seminary for the Fraternity of St. Peter in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Professors Eric Svensson and Gerald Matatex. Professor Eric Svensson will begin the debate. It is my great privilege to be here tonight to present to you the evangelical side of this issue. The issue tonight, as the moderator said, is what does the Bible teach about Mary's virginity? Now, my opponent and I are agreed on some of that. We agree, for instance, that Mary remained a virgin at least until she gave birth to Jesus. So there's no debate about that. The issue before us is what happened afterwards. Did Mary remain a virgin the rest of her life, as my opponent will argue, or did she engage in normal marital relations with her husband, as I will argue? Now, in one sense, my task tonight is very easy, because I am in the enviable position of simply presenting to you the plain reading of the New Testament data. Whereas my opponent, Mr. Maticus, is in the precarious position of having to explain to you why we should abandon that plain reading in favor of some convoluted interpretations. In another sense, my task tonight is difficult. You see, we really don't know what Mr. Maticus believes about this issue. Yes, we know he believes in Mary's perpetual virginity. But we don't know any of the specifics. You see, it's just not the case that there are only two positions on this issue, contrary to what the flyer that advertised this debate may have suggested to you. As a matter of historical fact, there are three positions one could take. The first position, known as the Helvidian view, is the view that I will argue, this is uh, by far the majority Protestant view today, it says simply that Mary had other children and Jesus had biological brothers and sisters. A second view is called the Hieronymian view. The Hieronymian view is uh, by far the, the majority Catholic view today. 
it follows Jerome in positing that when we find brothers and sisters of Jesus in the New Testament, they are actually his cousins or close relatives. The third view is called the Epiphanian view. Uh, the Epiphanian view is held by virtually no one today except for a handful of proponents in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but it uh, posits that these brothers and sisters of Jesus in the New Testament are actually his step-brothers and sisters, children of Joseph by a previous marriage. Now, as I mentioned, we don't really know which of the latter two views my opponent holds. As, as recently as four or five weeks ago when I spoke to him personally, he himself did not know. He asked me simply to defend my uh, one specific view against both positions. Now, that's just a bit unfair, uh, in my opinion, because that would be akin to my inviting Mr. Mattis to debate the doctrine of predestination. And then when he asks me, which view do you subscribe to, I tell him, well, I don't really subscribe to a view. I just believe in the general concept of predestination. And you're just going to have to defend your view against all four viable positions within evangelicalism. It wouldn't be fair for me to ask Mr. Mattis to do that. It's likewise unfair. Uh, for him to ask me to, to defend my specific position against a general concept of marriage professional virginity, which actually encompasses two specific positions. Now, having said that, I'm prepared to argue against both of those positions tonight. However, I see Mr. Matisic coming down on one side. I'm going to assume he holds that position. Because, you see, it is not the case that these are interchangeable ideas. These two positions that held the uh, Epiphanian view and the Hieronymian view are based on mutually exclusive premises and arguments. So I'm going to ask my opponent to be consistent with, with whatever road he decides to take tonight. The evidence for the Helvidian view, the evangelical view, the view I am defending of this issue, may be broken down into four main arguments. Number one, Matthew 1.18 says, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now the phrase, before they came together, is soon erchamai in the Greek, and it means simply to come together. But it is often used in context to denote sexual relations. Scholars point to Wisdom 7.2 as an example of this usage, as well as a variant reading in 1 Corinthians 7.5. The West Ten of Widow and Scott cites another instance of this phrase that bears the meaning to share the bed. The well, lexicon of Bauer, Art, Diggers, and Danker, the scholarly standard today, uh, cites both Philo and Josephus, both of whom use this word to denote sexual relations. The well, lexicon of Lowe and Nita gives the meaning sexual relations as that which is to, to be applied to Matthew 1.18. But even the context suggests that this means sexual intercourse. Remember, the context is that Mary is betrothed to Joseph. But it is before they came together that she is found to be with child. Indeed, Matthew's purpose for this phrase is very polemic. He mentions that Mary conceived before she and Joseph came together to convince his readers that this was a virginal birth and not an ordinary one. Now, why do I bother to mention something so seemingly obvious about the text? Because Catholic apologists invariably argue, as will my opponent tonight, that Mary took a vow of virginity prior to her conception of Jesus and therefore never intended to have sexual relations with Joseph. The phrase, before they came together, must on this view mean before they came together platonically, that is to say, before they began to reside together. The text is thus stripped of any reference to sexual relations. Such a view, however, raises more questions than it answers. Why would Matthew mention this phrase at all if he knew sexual re relations had never occurred? If we take this simply as a reference to Joseph and Mary make, uh, taking up residence together with, without thought of ensuing sexual relations, Matthew's point regarding the virgin birth is then quite lost. If he is attempting to show, as he surely is in this passage, that the birth of Christ was a virginal birth, then the phrase, before they came together, must mean before they engaged in sexual relations, and cannot mean before they came together in a platonic living arrangement. For if the latter is true, then it would be no more remarkable, nor significant for that matter, if Mary was pregnant before they came together, than it would be if she became pregnant after they came together. Number two, Luke 2, 7 says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. Now the plain meaning of the word firstborn, prototokos in the Greek, implicitly suggests subsequent born children. 
Catholic apologists often counter that the word firstborn in this passage need not imply that other children were born afterward, since it is often used in context where subsequent children were either not yet born or not mentioned. In the case of Mary, however, one can only assume that Luke is still uh, familiar enough with her situation to know whether or not she was an avowed virgin. If Luke had known of any decision by Mary to remain a virgin postpartum, it seems certain he would not have used a phrase that would lend itself to such misunderstanding. Such a phrase would make sense only if Luke knew of other children born of Mary, or at the very least that Mary still had childbearing potential. Indeed, if Luke had known of Mary's perpetual virginity, it seems certain that he would not have used the word prototokos, which means firstborn, but rather the word monogenes, which means only born in Luke. Luke uses the latter word in three other passages to refer to someone's only child. In Luke 7, 12, we read, As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. In Luke 8, 41 through 42, we read, Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. And in Luke 9, 38, we read, A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. In each of these passages, the word monogamous is used, not prototokos. In any case, Luke could not have subscribed to the notion of a supposed vow of virginity on Mary's part, for as Catholic New Testament scholar John P. Meyer notes, quote, since the author who writes Luke 2, 7 also speaks of Jesus' mother and brothers in Luke 8 and Acts 1, the title firstborn takes on a more precise meaning in light of the larger context, end quote. Number three. Matthew 1.25, I'm sorry, Matthew 1.24 through 25, tells us that Joseph did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. This passage not only demonstrates Mary's prenatal virginity, but also directly conflicts with any notion of ongoing postnatal virginity. Matthew tells us that Joseph abstained from sexual union with Mary until she gave birth, implying that normal marital relations ensued after the birth of Jesus. Now, my opponent will counter this point by appealing to the use of the word until, heos in the Greek, elsewhere in Scripture. He will argue, no doubt, that this word means only that some action did not happen up to a certain point, but does not imply that the action did happen later. Catholic apologists often appeal to passages where Hetos has this meaning, such as 2 Samuel 6.23, Genesis 8.7, and Deuteronomy 34.6. While there is little doubt that passages where Hetos has this meaning could be multiplied, rarely is it mentioned by these apologists that this is not the Greek phrase used in Matthew 1.25. In all the passages cited by these apologists, the word Hetos alone is used. But in Matthew 1.25, the Greek construction Hetos ku is used. The phrase heos who, with its variant form, heos hasu, which grammarians treat as the same, occurs a total of 22 times in the New Testament. Four of these have the meaning while, denoting contemporaneousness. Matthew 5.25, Matthew 14.22, Matthew 26.36, and Luke 13.8. Whereas the other 18 occurrences have the meaning until, and these are all instances in which the action of the main clause is changed by the action of the subordinate clause and requires the meaning until a specified time, but not after. Hence, the wicked servant was to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed, Matthew 18.34. But that torture, it is implied, would cease after payment had been rendered. The woman who loses the coin sweeps the house and searches carefully until she finds it, Luke 15.8. But clearly, she ceases the search once the coin is found. Other instances carry the same meaning. The disciples were to stay in Jerusalem after Christ's ascension until they had been clothed with power from on high, Luke 24, 49. But then they were expected to leave Jerusalem and take the gospel into all the world. The days of the purification rite, which Paul observed, Acts 21, 26, lasted only until a sacrifice was offered. Likewise, Festus ordered Paul to be kept in Caesarea until he could send him to Rome, Acts 25, 21. Once he left for Rome, he was no longer kept in Caesarea. Finally, Peter entreats us to pay attention to the word of the prophets as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises, 2 Peter 1.19. Doubtless a reference to the second coming of Christ, after which it will no longer be necessary to turn to the word of the prophets as a guide which navigates us through a dark place, since the presence of Christ himself will supersede any such need. 
The instances of Hetero 2 that come closest to Matthew 125 are perhaps those instances of the phrase where the main clause is negated. Remember that Matthew 125 tells us that Joseph did not know her until she gave birth to a son. Similarly, the disciples were told not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had been raised from the dead, Matthew 17, 9. Jesus promised not to eat and drink again in the kingdom until the kingdom of God comes, Luke 22, 18. The rooster would not grow until Peter disowned Christ three times, John 13, 38, and Paul's Jewish adversaries vowed not to eat or drink anything until they had killed Paul, Acts 23, 12. In each of these cases where Hetero 2 is used with a negative, there is a complete reversal of the action of the main clause after the until has occurred. Hence, the disciples will witness the transfiguration at the resurrection. Jesus will eat and drink again in the kingdom. The rooster will crow after Peter's denial. The Jews do intend to eat and drink after they kill Paul. And Joseph does know Mary after the birth of Christ. What are we to conclude from this evidence? simply that the meaning of the phrase the Catholic apologist proposes for Matthew 125 is completely elsewhere in the New Testament. Perhaps even more significant is the fact that there is not even one instance of this phrase in all the searchable non-biblical literature spanning from the beginning of the first century B.C. through the end of the first century B.C. means what it must mean in Matthew 125 for the Catholic position to be true. Any time it means until in this literature, it always, and without exception, means until, but not after. There are no examples of the Catholic understanding of this phrase for at least a century and a half before Matthew wrote his Gospel, nor up to a half a century afterwards. The literary evidence suggests, therefore, that the Greek speaker of Matthew's day would have understood the phrase Ta'o 2 in Matthew 125 to imply cessation of Mary's virginity after the birth of Jesus had taken place. In a recent debate Mr. Matisic had uh, with uh, evangelical apologist James White, Mr. Matisic in his closing statement had this to say, quote, often Protestants try to use Greek in a way to mislead people, end quote. Mr. Matisic then alluded to a previous debate on the Marian doctrines that he had had with Mr. White, in which Mr. White argued precisely what I have argued tonight for the meaning of Ta'osu. Mr. Matisic said that he went home after the debate and looked up the phrase Ta'osu in a Greek concordance and found that the reason Matthew uses it in Matthew 125 instead of Ta'os alone is because Ta'os alone is a conjunction. Mr. Matisic said, quote, Ta'osu uh, is a conjunction. The reason he, Matthew, doesn't use Ta'os alone is because it's followed by a verbal clause and not a noun which a preposition takes, end quote. In making such an assertion, Mr. Matisic has done the very thing of which he has accused Protestants. Namely, he has used Greek to mislead people. It is certainly true that heosu is a conjunction, but that hardly explains why Matthew chose to use this phrase over the simple word heos. The word heos is sometimes used as a preposition, as Mr. Matisic has pointed out, but other times as a conjunction. Matthew 18.30, Luke 1.80, Luke 12.59, Luke 13.35. I could go on to list no fewer than 15 passages in which heos is used as a conjunction. Had Matthew wanted to convey the notion that Joseph abstained from having sexual relations with Mary even after the birth of Christ, he could have used heos alone, since as many as one-fifth of all instances of the temporal use of heos has this meaning. Better still, he could have used, and probably should have used, the phrase heos on. Since not only are all twenty occurrences of this phrase used as conjunctions in the thematics criterion, but fourteen of these imply no change at all in the action of the main clause after the until has been reached, even when used with a negative. Whatever meaning we finally adopt for Hetos 2 in Matthew 125 must be tempered by the fact that this phrase never elsewhere has the meaning until and continuing or until with no reference to continuation or discontinuation in the New Testament or in the literature in the two centuries surrounding the birth of Christ. Moreover, when used with a negative, this phrase in this literature always means not X until Y after which X ensues. In the case of Matthew 125, the meaning is clearly that Joseph did not have sexual relations with Mary until she gave birth to, the, to her son, after which sexual relations ensued. So far from remaining silent on this issue, the scriptures here provide us with positive evidence of Mary's normal marital relations after the birth of Jesus. Now, the Catholic apologists might counter this argument by asking how we, indeed how Luke, could possibly have known something as private as whether or not Mary and Joseph engaged in sexual relations after the birth of Jesus. Did Luke ask Joseph or Mary if they had engaged in sexual relations? Well, obviously not. 
But of course, this objection falls flat if Luke knew that Jesus had biological brothers and sisters. In such a case, Luke could hardly avoid the necessary conclusion that Mary and Joseph must have been sexually active. Which brings me to my final point, namely, that the New Testament speaks of Jesus' brothers and sisters. A synopsis of the relevant passage as follows. Matthew tells us, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside, wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside, wanting to speak to you. Matthew 12, 46 through 47, parallels in Mark 3, Luke 8. He also tells us, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Matthew 13, 55 through 56, parallel in Mark 6. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, John 2, 12. Jesus' brother said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. For even his own brothers did not believe in him, John 7, 3 through 5. Luke tells us the apostles all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, Acts 1, 14. Paul asks, don't we have the right to take along a believing wife with us as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Paul also says, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. Galatians 1, 19. Again, the text speaks for themselves. The plain, natural reading is that Jesus had biological brothers and sisters. Undaunted by the overwhelming evidence against their position, Catholic apologists often counter the word autophos, translated in these passages as brother, can sometimes mean cousin or close relative. They point to instances in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, where autophos has this meaning, and they suggest that this is just what is reminded of the passages that speak of the brothers of Jesus. These brothers, it is argued, are actually his cousins or some other close relatives. This view, however, is fraught with difficulties. First, it severely weakens the natural reading and theological point of such passages as Matthew 12, 46 through 50. We've read this one, but it bears repeating. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Not only are his mother and brothers seen as a unit in this passage, as though they are of the same household, but as Catholic New Testament scholar Eugene Laverdier notes, deposit that these brothers are in reality cousins or close relatives severely weakens the punchline that Jesus delivers at the end of this passage. Are we really to conclude that what Jesus is saying here is, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my cousin, close relative, Folks, the New Testament teaches we are the brothers of Jesus. As Catholic New Testament scholar John P. Meyer notes, quote, the full force of the aphorism is retained only if the natural relationships mentioned are all equally close and blood-related, end quote. Another passage that is similarly weakened is John 7, through, uh, 3 through 5. We've read this one as well, but it bears repeating. Jesus' brother said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. If we are to assume that brothers equals cousins in this passage, what we are left with is a comparatively empty episode. Again, the words of Catholic New Testament scholar John T. Meyer, quote, The bitter sadness of this aside loses a great deal of its rhetorical force if it means instead for not even his cousins believed in him, end quote. In both passages above, the demon is all but lost if the Catholic view is adopted. Moreover, the view itself, this view itself is based on the prior assumption that cousin or close relative is an appropriate designation for autophos in the New Testament. While the word does sometimes denote a relative in the Septuagint, that is the Greek Old Testament, it is never used that way in the New Testament. Unlike its counterpart in the Septuagint, there are no instances of autophos in the New Testament that, that bear the mean relative, except, of course, where the reference is to biological siblings. Again, Catholic scholar John T. Meyer says, quote, with full brother and half-brother, we exhaust the literal meaning of autophos found in the New Testament. He goes on, it never means stepbrother, the solution of Epiphanius, or cousin, the solution of Jerome, end quote. This is a Catholic scholar, folks. Indeed, autophos is often found in passages where relatives in the broad sense are clearly distinguished from immediate siblings. 
In Luke 14, 12, we read, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. The word relatives, sungenes, here denotes a different class of people than brothers, adolfos, friends, and neighbors. Similarly, uh, with Luke 21, 16, which says, you will be betrayed by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. Here again, the word relative, sungenes, denotes a different class than brothers, adolfos, and the two are no more interchangeable than our parents and brothers. The New Testament writers do have a number of special designations for relatives outside of the immediate family. As we've already seen, Luke favors the word sungenes, and he uses it again in Luke 136 to refer to Elizabeth, the relative of Mary. It is significant that Luke recognizes the distinction between sungenes and autophos because Luke is one of the writers who makes mention of the autophoi, the brothers of Jesus, once in his gospel and once in Acts. A second word, anepsios, occurs in Colossians 4.10 to refer to Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Since obviously Paul knew of this word, he certainly could have used it in such texts as Galatians 1.19 and 1 Corinthians 9.5, both of which mention the Lord's brothers, if his intent was to refer to the cousins of Jesus. As Catholic New Testament scholar John McHugh observes, quote, it was not for a lack of a wider vocabulary that the evangelists wrote about the brothers of Jesus, end quote. It seems evident from the words sungenes and anepsios that both Paul and Luke knew of ways to denote cousins or close relatives when that is what they meant. In any case, as Catholic scholar, New, uh, New Testament scholar John P. Meyer again points out, quote, the very reason why we know that autophos in the Septuagint can mean cousin, nephew, or some other relative, is that the immediate context regularly makes the exact relationship clear. He goes on. No such clarification is given in the New Testament text concerning the brothers of Jesus, end quote. Indeed, even in the Greek literature contemporaneous to the New Testament, there is no clear-cut example of autophos or autophe, which is the feminine form, sister, denoting a cousin. So that the eminent Catholic New Testament scholar Joseph Fitzmaier, in his commentary on Luke, is forced to conclude, quote, Jerome thought that Adolphus could be a cousin, but this is almost certainly to be ruled out as the New Testament meaning, end quote. Moreover, Adolphe, sister, in the New Testament, is also used to denote a sibling of some sort, whether biological, spiritual, or figurative. It is never used to denote relatives broadly or cousins specifically. In similar vein, everywhere Adolphos, that is brother, is used in context in which a brother is named, it too refers to a sibling. Catholic New Testament scholar John McKenzie observes, quote, There is no instance of the use of brothers and sisters for more remote kinsmen and kinswomen when the words accompany an enumeration of names, end quote. Now both of these points are significant for our discussion, because both are true of the passages dealing with the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Hence, when Matthew and Mark named the Adolfoi, the brothers of Jesus, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, Matthew 13, 55, Mark 6, 3, and at the same time speak of his Adolfi, his sisters, Matthew 13, 56, and Mark 6, 3, it is beyond serious dispute that the normal reading of these texts is that Jesus had biological brothers and sisters. Whereas these words do sometimes mean spiritual sibling, or in the case of autophos, or used as a term of endearment in a personal address, Acts 22.1, these meanings can hardly be applied to those who, quote, did not believe in him, John 7.5. Instead, whenever the New Testament calls X, the brother or sister of Y, where the reference is to a family relationship, it always means that X is the biological sibling of Y, children of at least one common parent. This precludes not only the higher and any view, namely that these are brothers and sisters of Jesus, uh, that these brothers and sisters of Jesus are his cousins or close relatives, but also the Epiphanian view, namely that these are children of Joseph by a previous marriage. Both views are refuted on biblical and philological grounds, and no amount of clever argumentation by my opponent can change the fact that the evidence is squarely against the Roman Catholic position on this issue. Thank you very much. Professor Jerry Matisic. Oh, thank you, Mr. Press. You don't have to take memory? Okay. Oh, that's fine.
Well, I too had a few surprises by way of travel. I was supposed to be in San Jose Tuesday and uh, wasn't allowed onto the uh, plane. They had overbooked it um, from Scranton, and so I ended up going to uh, ended up going to uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, Tuesday, uh, Monday night rather, uh, and didn't get a chance to see uh, get a look at uh, Eric Spenson's uh, book on Catholic uh, his his response to Catholic apologists until I had one uh, FedEx to me yesterday. So I am also a little bit, I've been giving three days worth of talks in New Mexico. I have a full day of talks in Sacramento tomorrow, and I'll be speaking here in San Jose again on Sunday. So I would ask that you would pray for me that I would be able to do my very best uh, job. I stand before you tonight as a Bible-believing Christian. My sole purpose this evening in this debate is to honor my Lord Jesus Christ by teaching the truth concerning his mother as found in sacred scripture, God's inspired inerrant word. In honoring the mother of our Savior, I seek, of course, to honor him, to honor the Son, because it is he who honored her first by choosing her to be his mother. And I simply seek, as every Christian should, to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Part of honoring the mother of the Savior is acknowledging that God did something stupendous in and through her, which we call the Incarnation, God himself becoming man. The paradox, the wonder of the, what we call the Incarnation, is that now there was a person who was two things that had never been true before of one of the same person. He was and remains a divine person, but now possessed, in addition to the divine nature, which he had always possessed from all eternity, a human nature as well. One divine person with two natures. He was God, and he was man. Up to this point, there had been God, and there had been man, but there was no one who was both at the same time. Now there was. This was unique. And God chose to become a man through a woman, to take his flesh, his human nature, from a woman. And God decreed from all eternity that the most appropriate way to do this was to make her a virgin mother, so that the uniqueness of the one who is to be both God and man, two terms that up till then had been incompatible, mutually exclusive, this uniqueness was to be mirrored in the woman he was to be born from, for she too would now be two things that never before had been simultaneously true of one person, virgin and mother, simultaneously and perpetually. There were virgins up to this point, and there were mothers, but never, ever anyone who was both in the fullest, most literal, most permanent sense of each of those two words at the same time. So the one paradox, the God-man, found a parallel in a second paradox in God's plan of salvation, the virgin mother. And this is from the moment of the Incarnation on, Jesus was both God and man forever, never ceasing to be one both, to, never seems to be both at one and the same time. So from that moment on, the moment of the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary, Mary was to forever be virgin and mother at one and the same time, never ceasing to be one or the other. Now the Catholic Church teaches and has always taught based on the testimony not only of sacred scripture, but on the testimony of what Jesus and Our Lady and the Apostles taught that was not recorded in scripture, what we call sacred tradition. Based on both of these, the Catholic Church has always taught, and I want to clarify something in case you might have been as confused as I, I think I might have been by something uh, that Mr. Svensson said. The Catholic position on this has been dogmatically defined. It is not that there is more than one possible Catholic position on this, or that the majority of Catholics hold something, or you heard re reference to many, quote, Catholic scholars this evening who seem to reject what the church has dogmatically defined. I will come back to that point later on, but you need to know that when Mr. Svensson said Catholic scholar John P. Meyer, that he's quoting a modernist. John P. Meyer, in his book A Marginal Jew, not only denies the church's defined teaching about the perpetual virginity of Mary, or casts aspersions on it, he denies that our Lord was born in Bethlehem. He says there are other legendary and mythical things. Uh, the other, that goes for the other, quote, Catholic scholars that he cited tonight, such as John McKenzie or Joseph Fitzmaier. These men are modernists, and any honest appraisal of their work will yield to that conclusion very quickly. 
it's rather like saying, as, you know, if we were having a bit on the papacy or the infallibility, as Catholic scholar Hans P. Kuhn says, in fact, that is exactly what uh, Mr. Stenson does time and again in his book, Evangelical Answers, quoting as a Catholic scholar, a person who explicitly rejects one or more defined truths of the Catholic faith. I think there's a little bit of confusion that could result from that practice, even if it was unintentional on Mr. Stenson's part. The Catholic Church teaches and has always taught that Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Jesus. I'm not going to spend any time on the first point because Mr. Svensson pointed out uh, he accepts that part of the Church's teaching. I'm grateful that Mr. Svensson at least believes that Mary was a virgin at the time that she conceived Jesus because most Protestants today no longer believe this, even though it is a clear teaching of sacred scripture. So Mr. Svensson agrees tonight that Mary was is spoken of in scripture as a virgin. She is referred to as a virgin in prophecy in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 7, 14, for example. She is referred to as a virgin in St. Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 1, and elsewhere. So he agrees that by the supernatural activity of God, she conceived our Lord and yet did not lose her virginity in conceiving him. She remained a virgin after conceiving him. Now, if Mr. Svensson is going to claim that Mary did not remain a virgin her entire life, he needs to show us explicitly since he says, I only believe, as a Protestant, what is clearly recorded in sacred scripture. I don't follow tradition. I don't follow the teachings of mere men. I base my beliefs squarely on the explicit statements of sacred scripture. Then he is going to need to show us where in scripture this woman that he agrees at least starts out as a virgin, where she is, we are told that she loses her virginity. He needs to show us when, how, or by what she lost his virginity. And that he will not be able to do this evening although he certainly has done a very good job of attempting it in his opening uh, introduction. Does he believe that she lost her virginity during the birth of Jesus? He has no proof of this, and I will show that Scripture clearly teaches otherwise. Does he believe that she lost her virginity after the birth of Jesus and having sexual relations with Joseph, and as a result having other children? He has no proof of this either, and I will show that Scripture clearly teaches otherwise. In short, I will show you tonight that the perpetual virginity of Mary is scriptural, and the denial of her perpetual virginity is not. And I mean two things by that. I mean, first of all, that positively, the scriptures positively teach. They contain many indications of her perpetual virginity. And secondly, negatively, there's nothing in scripture that contradicts or that precludes or rules out the fact of her perpetual virginity. I will take you through those two things in a minute, but I want to simply say here in the close of my introduction that I need to clear up a misconception right away. That misconception is uh, echoed by Mr. Svensson, as it is by most um, Protestant uh, apologists, that the idea of Mary's perpetual virginity was an idea that developed later on. It was an idea that seemed seemly, it seemed suitable, it seemed appropriate to postulate that Mary was a virgin her entire life, for whatever reason. And he says, you know, the reason isn't quite clear, but perhaps it's a way of exalting celibacy or virginity. I want, to be on, I want to go on record right now by telling you that, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, the perpetual virginity of Mary is taught by the Catholic Church for one simple reason. It is a historical fact. It is a fact that she obviously knew. If Our Lady was a virgin her entire life, then clearly she would have known that. Her husband would have known it. Her divine son would have known it. The apostles would have known it. The people that knew Mary would have known it. The people that wrote the New Testament would have known it. The perpetual virginity of Mary is a historical fact. And that, and that, that is why, and that is the only reason why, the Catholic Church teaches it. Not because it's a nice-sounding theory, not because it seems to buttress or, or buck up other ideas about Mary. It is rooted in space-time history. It is a fact like the fact that God created the world. It is a fact like the fact that God destroyed the world with a flood in the time of Noah. It is a fact like the fact that God parted the Red Sea in the time of the Exodus, so that he kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego supernaturally preserved in the fiery furnace. Like the fact that God became a man, born as a baby in Bethlehem. Like the fact that he died upon the cross for our sins. Like the fact that he rose again three days later. Like the fact that he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. It is a fact of history to which scripture testifies and the constant teaching of the church. And this is what 
We lost a portion of Professor Matatix at this point. We now pick up with the continuation on the master tape. Begun to have such a relation with Mary at that point, that the grammar requires it. Now, what can we say about these, these two points that, uh, he has, that this one passage refers to? The first thing that we can say is that even Protestant commentators and Protestant lexicons, that is, dictionaries of the Greek language, point out every single one, and I will ask Mr. Svensson to produce one single instance tonight, in your hearing, of any Greek lexicon written by Protestant or Catholic, doesn't matter, which says that the phrase translated come together has as its primary purpose sexual relationships so that there would need to be a clear statement in the context precluding this to allow you to interpret it in a different way. You will see, if you look at the Greek dictionaries, that the term can also be used, and is frequently used, to mean simply to uh, come into the, the marriage um, from a period of betrothal, that is, to finally enter into that final phase, because betrothal or engagement was more binding in uh, the biblical world than it was in our day. We think of engagement as something we can easily break. But that come together means to move out of the betrothal period into the period of actual full legal um, status of husband and wife. What about the word until? The, the second point that he makes. Uh, that the word until must mean uh, that, that it was only true until that point and doesn't, uh, doesn't hold true afterwards. Well, first of all, as Mr. Svensson admits in his own book, quoting Carl Keating's Development Fundamentalism and other standard apologetics works, there are many places where the preposition heos doesn't imply a change. Psalm 110, verse 1, God the Father saying to God the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. After our Lord conquers all his enemies, um, God doesn't say, now get out of my sight. We read the statement in 2 Samuel 6, 23, that um, Michal, King Saul's daughter, uh, King David's wife, had no children until the day of her death doesn't mean that she began to have children posthumously after she died. And there are many such passages. Now, stung by the fact that there are many places where the English word until, the Greek preposition heos, the Hebrew preposition as, clearly indicate that something can be true until it's point A and continue to be true, a rather novel argument has been hatched in the last couple of years in Protestant apologetics. Uh, perhaps pioneered by Mr. Svensson, I want to give credit where credit is due, that, okay, well, we won't use, um, we won't confine ourselves, or we won't even look at as relevant the places where the Greek word heos is used. We'll only look at the passages where it's heos who. And Mr. S um, Mr. Svensson pointed out that James White used this in a debate against me a couple of years ago. Now, I pointed out in that debate some things that Mr. Svensson didn't mention this this evening, and that is that um, there are there is at least five things wrong with saying "heos who" the Greek phrase used in Matthew one twenty five must mean, even if "heos" doesn't by itself, must mean that Joseph would have had to change his abstinence afterwards. He had to have relations with her. First of all, as Mr. Svensson has already alluded to, any first year Greek student should know the difference between a preposition and a conjunction. Now, Mr. Svensson has said. That, um, that heos who, uh, or that heos can be used as a uh, preposition or as a conjunction. I would like to ask him to show us that. Not to simply state it and expect us to take it on his say so, but to show us other passages that he feels sheds uh, uh, relevant light grammatically upon Matthew 125. The fact is, if you look in Molten and Gaden, which is the standard exhaustive concordance of the Greek New Testament, you will see heos listed as a preposition, and heos who listed as a conjunction. And the point I made in the debate a couple of years ago, which I didn't mention, is that the reason St. Matthew has to use heos who in this uh, passage is because what follows is not a noun. A preposition takes a noun. The mouse ran under the table. Under is a preposition, and it's followed by a noun, table. I went through the door. Through the preposition, followed by a noun. But when you have a verbal clause, you can't precede that, bless you, with a preposition. You have to precede it with a conjunction. 
And that is exactly what we have in Matthew 125. That he had no relations with her until she gave birth to her son. You see, what follows is a, is a verbal clause. She gave birth, not a noun. And so a conjunction is called for in grammar. That's why heos who is used. Secondly, no Protestant lexicon, and again, I, I, I respectfully challenge Mr. Um, Svensson to give us one example tonight. No Protestant lexicon says that there's a semantic difference between heos and heos who. That heos means, well, something might be true up until a point X, and then maybe it go goes on being true, and maybe it doesn't. You have to look at the context. But every time heos who occurs, it means there must be a change. There's a difference between these two. No Protestant lexicon says that. And I would again ask Mr. Svensson to quote one that tells us what he wants the difference between the two terms to mean. Thirdly, even Protestant scholars admit in their commentaries that this verse does not disprove the perpetual virginity of Mary. Scholars who, who have done their uh, work and looked at this have admitted this. For example, I'll quote Henry Alford, a scholar probably greater than Mr. Svensson and I put together. His Greek New Testament, which holds, comprises many volumes, is loaded with all kinds of textual critical information, all kinds of Latin um, uh, critical apparatus. And here's what he says on page 9 of his commentary on Matthew. The commentary, the, the text is in Greek, there's a lot of scholarly annotations, and he says, the words of this verse do not require that Joseph's uh, absence from Mary change after the point. The idiom uh, can be fully justified on the contrary hypothesis, that is, that Joseph and Mary never had relations. You could still use this idiom that he had no relations with her until. The same is said of Robert Gundry, a, a New Testament scholar, an evangelical Protestant, who is at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, who says in his massive commentary on St. Matthew, on page 25, commenting on Heos Who, he says, quote, by itself, Heos Who, which belongs to Matthew's preferred diction, there's when Matthew uses Heos, he prefers to follow it with Who. He uses that, that's characteristic of his style. By itself, Heos Who, which belongs to Matthew's preferred diction, does not necessarily imply that Joseph and Mary entered into normal sexual relations after Jesus' birth. And I could quote other scholars who say and admit the same thing. So we see that this, this argument, that if we really pay attention to Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, we have to reject the professor of Virginia of Mary, doesn't hold water. Even Protestants admit that this argument is not an argument against the professor of Virginia of Mary. So we need to reject this argument and say this does not prove Mr. Svensson's point. It does not um, refute the classic 2,000-year-old teaching of the church that Mary was a virgin her entire life. You'll have to come up with another argument than this one. Let's move on to his second argument. His second argument is from Luke chapter 2, verse 7, that Our Lady brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And he lays emphasis upon the word firstborn here. Now, what's interesting is that the word firstborn, prototokos, which he uh, uh, mentioned, is also we are told in Protestant commentaries, a term that does not imply necessarily, you have to look at the context, that subsequent children follow. I would refer you to the, the largest Greek lexicon we have. It is a Protestant production. Gerhard Kitzel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament in ten volumes. And if you turn to the article on uh, this word, prototokos, in uh, volume six, you read here that uh, several of the same statements that contradict the impression that Mr. Svensson and other Protestant apologists would like to leave with you. For example, you read on page 872 that we have a Jewish burial inscription from this very period, from the time of the birth of our Lord, from 5 B.C., which reads, and then it gives you the Greek and it, and it translates it, uh, in the travail of the birth of the first child, of my first child, my prototokos, Destiny brought me to the end of life. It's the epitaph of a woman who died giving birth to her first child. The child is described as being her prototokos, her firstborn son. Clearly, she didn't have others. So here is one instance in which the word prototokos can be legitimately applied. This Greek term can be applied to a child who is an only child. There is a word that means only child, monogenes. I certainly agree with that, but my point is that prototokos can be properly used 
linguistically, legally used to mean a child that one has, that makes one a parent, even if there are no other children following. In fact, this article goes on to say the same thing several times. It mentions uh, when this word is used in the Septuagint of the Old Testament, that the expression does not suggest, when it says that Israel is God's firstborn son, that the other nations are, are also God's sons. Um, it says, the firstborn here is not seen in relation to other brothers, but solely as an object of the special love of his father. The idea of priority in time over other sons is remote. The orientation of the word is no longer to the presence of other sons at all. And other Protestant lexicons, which if I had time I could quote here, say the same thing. Prototokos, firstborn, doesn't imply that there have to be uh, second or third uh, children to follow. Uh, it can be used legitimately as it's used in Exodus 13. When in Exodus 13 a Jewish couple finally become parents, they are to take their firstborn son and offer it up in a special uh, ceremony of confiscation. And nobody stops them and says, wait a minute, you have to wait till you have a second child, and then you can call this one your firstborn son. The term firstborn, both the Hebrew term and the Greek word prototokos, is applied to the child at that very time, without any knowledge of whether subsequent children will be born to that particular couple. So this argument also really doesn't hold water, even based on the testimony of Protestant scholars in lexicons and commentaries. The fact that Mary brought forth her firstborn son doesn't require grammatically that she had to have brought forth others. And so again, this one doesn't force us to reject the teaching that Mary had to have other children because otherwise Christ could not be legally or linguistically accurately called her firstborn. The third and the final argument is that there are references to the brothers of Jesus in the New Testament, in Matthew 13, 55, Mark 3, 31, and other places. And Mrs. Benson uh, reminded us that um, this Greek word, adelphos, uh, is, is a word that is the subject of very hot and heavy debate between Protestants and Catholics. What, in fact, do Protestants have to say themselves about this particular word? Again, Protestant commentaries can be quoted, Protestant scholars can be quoted as indicating that the word brother does not have to be taken in the strict sense of a sibling. The Bible uses the word in a broader sense. In the Old Testament, for example, Abraham in Genesis 13:8 says to Lot, we should not be arguing for we are brothers. And yet the, the chapter makes it very clear, as every Protestant Catholic agrees, that Abraham is Lot's uncle, and Lot is his nephew. And yet the same Greek word adelphos, in the plural here, we are brothers, adelphoi, is used there. And there are other passages, Genesis 14, 14 and others, in which the word is used in a broader sense to mean a near kinsman, a relative. Not a cousin. That is something that Mr. Svensson uh, wants to, I think, perhaps drag his red herring across our trail and say, Adelphos does not mean cousin. No Catholic apologist claims that it does. We're saying the word can be used in a strict sense to mean a sibling from the same biological mother, or in a broader sense to simply mean a near kinsman. Not so precisely determined as a cousin, but some sort of relative. It might be a, ne it might be a nephew, it might be an uncle, it could be some other uh, type of relation. But the fact is the Bible uses the Greek word in this way. And Mr. Svensson is going to have to prove that this Septuagint use of this uh, word has no influence or impact upon the writers of the New Testament. When the fact is that 70% of the time the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's quoting from the Septuagint. And again, if we were reading a book about the debate about Mary, in a calmer moment, Protestants and Catholics agree that the Septuagint heavily influences the Greek language used in the New Testament. And it's absurd to engage in a case of special pleading and saying, well, then, then the consequences of that are, are, are drastic for us when we're looking at the Virginia of Mary, so we better say that the Septuagint use of the word Adelphos has no relevance whatsoever to what it means when, say, Matthew uses it in uh, chapter 13, verse 55. What's more puzzling, however, is that if you take the statement in Matthew 13, 55, where people are saying, aren't the brothers of Jesus here with us, James and Joseph and Simon and Jude, and you fast forward 14 chapters to Matthew 27, 55 and 56, we find out who the mother of these, uh, these sons are. Because we're told at the foot of the cross, in addition to Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of our Lord, there is another Mary, the wife of Cleopas. 
who is the mother of James and Joseph. So two of those four sons are mentioned again, and they are clearly identified as children of another woman. And if Protestants will compare scripture with scripture and see that the brothers of Jesus mentioned in Matthew 13.55 are called the children of another woman. In fact, if we look at John chapter 19, verse 25 in the context, we see that this other woman is called the sister of Mary. Here the Greek verb, uh, the Greek form is used, Adelphe, meaning the, the, uh, the, the female counterpart to an Adelphos. Does it mean that she is the sibling of Mary, that Mary's parents had two girls and they named them both Mary? That idea is absurd on the face of it. So we have proof from the Bible itself that the word Adelphe clearly can't mean sibling in the case of John 19.25, that, that, that Mary, the wife of Cleopas, is not the sibling of Mary, the mother of our Lord, but simply a near kinswoman. And the same holds for the, for the, uh, for the English, uh, for the masculine uh, excuse me, counterpart, Adelphos. So this argument also really falls to the ground. And it falls to the ground even when Protestant reformers admitted uh, that there is nothing in this verse that argues against the production of Mary. I was astounded to discover that John Calvin, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, all marvelous Bible scholars by any Protestant standard, all rejected the interpretation of these verses that Mr. Svensson holds, and Protestant apologists hold today, they believed in the perfection of of Mary. They read the same Bible that Mr. Svensson did, but they didn't come to his conclusion. And so this argument, it doesn't necessarily, inevitably draw us to reject what the Bible teaches about the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, all I've had time to do in this opening statement is to show you that there's nothing in the Bible that contradicts the virginity of Mary. I, ha I will not have time until uh, I get up the next time I'm up to bat here to show you the positive indications, what the Bible teaches us that shows us, that indicates that Mary did not have other children, besides the fact that it never says that. There is not a single statement anywhere in the New Testament that says Mary had other children. There is no reference to any people that are called the children or the sons of Mary. And not only is there a deafening silence on this all-important point, which Mr. Svensson says you have to believe that Mary had other children, well, where's the verse, Mr. Svensson, that says that, that explicitly postulates that? We'll see there are many verses which indicate that um, Mary could not have had other children, and we'll look at those um, when my... Um, my next time is up, because I'm out of time now. And we start with Mr. Spencer. So Mr. Mantis made several points um, that I want to address. I'm sure I'm not going to be able to address all of them in this 10-minute uh, period. Uh, He'osu. He mentioned He'osu, and he... Uh, one point that he kept hammering home is that you won't find any distinction in any lexicon between heos and heosu. Well, uh, that's not surprising since lexicons do not handle grammatical constructions. They handle words. You'll find heos, you'll find who, you won't find heosu or any other grammatical construction. But the fact is, grammatical constructions are identified as a matter of course by scholars. For instance, the phrase afri who is identified by C.K. Barrett, who is a uh, New Testament scholar, that has a different meaning than achri by itself. But the, the, the uh, addition of the particle who changes that meaning in the same way that the addition of the particle who changes the meaning of heos. Now, I challenge Mr. Maddox, and I, I, I look forward to asking some questions during cross-examination, because I want to know one instance, just one instance, where the phrase heos who has the meaning that he needs it to mean in Matthew 125 in the New Testament or in the surrounding literature of the New Testament, uh, namely the uh, Hellenistic Greek literature of the 200 years surrounding the birth of Christ. He won't be able to find it. I know that personally because I have personally examined every occurrence as a part of my doctoral dissertation. Now, he mentioned that uh, scholars uh, uh, tend, to, uh, tend to say that this phrase could mean that Matthew uh, and... and, and and Mary did not have children afterwards. But the, the fact is, folks, most of the scholars that are commenting on this, that Mr. Madison has pointed out, are older commentaries. New scholarship in Greek is, uh, overturns older scholarship in Greek as a matter of course. This happens every day. He mentioned Calvin and Luther and Zwingli, for instance. Well, my friends, Calvin, Luther, and Zwingli did not have 
uh, a copy of Lagos Bible software on their computers. So they could not do these searches that we can today. They did not have uh, Thesaurus Linguae Glossae, which is a, a database that allows us to do searches uh, over a span of 800 years on the meanings of these words. They just did not have that advantage. So it's not surprising that they did not find that. Mr. Matic also addressed firstborn, the word firstborn, prototokos, and said, uh, he quoted a, a birth inscription. Um, I actually included that birth inscription in my uh, dissertation. And the fact is, that birth inscription uh, is there, but, the, but what Mr. Matic has not considered is the fact that in every case where this is used, it is, there is always an intent to have more children, if that's possible. But with Mary, there is no intent, is there? If she is supposed to be a perpetual virgin, and she's supposed to have taken a vow of virginity, there is no intent whatsoever. So that's the difference between any uh, instance you can find with firstborn of any other woman. There is always an intent to have more children. Just because death has prevented her does not mean there was uh, not that intent. Uh, Mr. Magic also addressed the word autophos and autophe, and uh, Jerry cited Old Testament passages uh, where it could mean close relatives, and he cited where Lot and, and, uh, and Abraham are called brothers. Well, that's true. If you look in the, the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, you're going to find that usage. But again, folks, words change as a matter of course. Over the course of the two or three hundred years between the, the last writing of the Septuagint and the first uh, New Testament writer picked up his pen to write scripture, there are etymological changes that take place. Mr. Madison is guilty of a fallacy called semantic obsolescence. Semantic obsolescence just means that uh, you foist a meaning that a word used to have onto a later time when there is no evidence that it has that meaning anymore. I challenge Mr. Matthews to produce one, just one, that's all we're asking, just one passage where autophos or autophase means close relative. I'll give him that. I didn't actually insist on cousin. I, I think through my presentation said close relative or cousin, uh, but if he misunderstood it, then I apologize. He can find one that, that means close relative he wants. I'll accept that. We just want one instance. This, it's not a difficult task, folks. Autophos shows up in the literature of the New Testament and in the literature surrounding the New Testament thousands and thousands and thousands of times. It would not be difficult, if Mr. Madison's position is true, to find one instance where, that he can point to that, that uh, supports the meaning that he's foisting upon in the New Testament. Mr. Madison also... Um, Actually, Mr. Matthews didn't address my, my fourth point. He addressed three of them. The fourth point was the Matthew 118 passage that, uh, where, where Matthew is insisting that it was before they came together, Suner Chamai, before they came together that, they, uh, that Mary was found to be with child. That is a polemic passage. Matthew's making a point to prove to his readers that this is a virginal birth, and so he must mean by the word Suner Chamai sexual relations and not just to come together. Mr. Mattis also asks about the usage of heos by itself, uh, the conjunctive usage of heos. He, he uh, has shown that it's a preposition. He asked me to produce one instance. Well, here they are. Uh, Luke 180 says, And he, John the Baptist, lived in the desert until he appeared. That's a verb, folks, not a noun. This is what Mr. Mattis is asking for. Until he appeared. This is the conjunctive usage. Luke 12, 59, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. That's a verb, not a noun. Luke 13, 35, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, a verb, not a noun. Luke 22, 34, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Deny is a verb, not a noun. John 21, 22. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? John is talking to Peter about John. Again, a verb is used. John 21, 23. If I want him to remain alive again until I return, same passage. Second uh, Thessalonians 2, 7. Uh, he will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. Again, another verb. First uh, Timothy 4, 13. Until I come. 
devote yourselves to public reading until I come. There again, another verb. Hebrews 10, 13. Since the time he waits until his enemies are made his footstool. That's another verb. James 5, 7. Until he receives the early and the latter rain. Folks, I can go on. I, I said in my opening presentation, Mr. Maybe Mr. Madison was not listening closely, I said I had 15 references up here. He asked me to name one. I've named almost all of them. I could go on, but I think it's uh, uh, at this point a bit superfluous. Um, Mr. Matisic also mentioned the argument from convenes, or the argument that is fitting. Mary, it is fitting that Mary should be a virgin the rest of her life and a mother at the same time. But folks, you don't get that from the New Testament. You just don't. Mr. Magic didn't cite anything in the New Testament that would lead you to believe that it should be fitting that Mary should be a virgin perpetually. He can quote tradition. But we're not talking about tradition. He alluded to the fathers. We're not talking about the fathers. The topic tonight is, what does the Bible teach about the perpetual virginity of Mary? It doesn't say, what is true about the perpetual virginity of Mary? That's not what it says. What does the Bible teach? He can appeal to church history if he wants. The fact is, there are uh, 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 fathers in the church, such as Irenaeus, Tertullian, Hegesippus, all who believed that Mary had other children. Mr. Magic also chided me for uh, quoting Catholic scholars, uh, and he is correct that Hans Kung, that he mentioned, uh, has been censured by the church, but none of the other scholars I mentioned have been censured. In fact, they are fully embraced. Raymond Brown and Joseph Fitzmaier are the two top uh, Catholic New Testament scholars today. Raymond Brown has served on the Pontifical Biblical Commission twice under two different popes. Mr. Matisic has not done that. They are in good standing in Rome. They have not been censured. They are fully embraced by Rome, and their views are in with good reason. They believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. They're just honest enough to admit that the New Testament doesn't teach it. They get it from tradition, not the New Testament. Thank you very much. Mr. Svensson said, and I need to respond to this challenge, show us anywhere in Scripture that there's any positive indication of the perpetual virginity of Mary. I will try to give you some of that, as I said, some of the positive case for it right now, and then interact with some of the things that he has just said. First of all, in the Old Testament, it is predicted that Mary would be a virgin not simply in conceiving Christ. I will skip for the moment Genesis 3.15, which predicts that there would be someone who would be the seed of the woman. A very odd phrase, because the standard phrase is the seed of the man. So here we see the virginity of the woman who would produce the seed, the promised seed, who would be uh, God's savior. Since Mr. Uh, Svensson accepts that part of the Bible from the church's teaching, that Mary was a virgin in conceiving Jesus, we'll move on to Isaiah 7:14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. That is, she's a virgin even in the act of birth. The Hebrew literally says, not a virgin shall conceive, but it's present. In fact, it's two present participles. Behold, a virgin conceiving and bearing a son. That is, there's one noun governing two verbs. A virgin in conceiving and a virgin in bearing or giving birth. I asked Mr. Svensson tonight if he believed in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Do you? I should have asked you ahead of time. Yes. You do. Okay, I'll have to ask him to elaborate on that then, uh, in the, perhaps in the cross-examination period. But if he believed in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, not in the virgin conception of Jesus Christ, then he believes that Mary did not lose her virginity even in the act of giving birth to Jesus. Otherwise, he's not using the term uh, accurately. So the Bible indicates that Mary's virginity would not end after the act of conception. She would continue to preserve it even in the act of giving birth to him. Christ did not come to take away anything of value by his incarnation, but to restore the incorruption of nature. And it would not be fitting that in his birth he would rob his mother of her virginity if he didn't need to rob her of it in his being conceived in the first place. There are other Old Testament prophecies and types of related to perpetual virginity. All the church fathers see in the vision that Ezekiel sees of the glorified temple 
in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, uh, a vision not only of Christ, Christ certainly applies to Ezekiel temple to himself, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, he says in St. John 2.19. Ezekiel sees water flowing from the right side of the temple there in Ezekiel 47. You probably know the passage. St. John says this is what he saw when he saw the water pouring out of the side of our Lord. But the church is the body of Christ, and so it too is a temple, as St. Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Each individual believer's body is a temple, as he says in 1 Corinthians 6.18. And for those reasons, Mary's body was also a temple. In her is Emmanuel, God with us. And the language that the angel applies to Our Lady in the Annunciation in St. Luke chapter 1, the Archangel Gabriel, indicates that the same language used to describe the coming down of the Holy Ghost upon the temple, the tabernacle in Ezekiel in Exodus 40, is applied to Mary. And so in Ezekiel 44, verse 2, we read that this temple has a special gate which is sealed shut, that nobody uh, enters and nobody comes out except God himself, and he does so without rupturing this sealed closed gate. And all the church fathers see this as a reference to Mary, because it is through the gate uh, that our Savior miraculously came without robbing her of her virginity. St. Ambrose says, what is this gate but Mary, and shut because she is a virgin? Mary then is the gate through which Christ came into this world when he was born by a virginal birth without loosing the bars of her virginity. St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae says the same thing. What means this closed gate in the house of the Lord except that Mary is to ever be inviolate, that is, unviolated? What does it mean that no man shall pass through it, save that Joseph shall not know her? And what is this that the Lord enters, the Lord alone enters in and goes out by it, except that the Holy Ghost shall impregnate her, and that the Lord of angels shall be born of her? And what means this that it shall be shut forevermore, but that Mary is a virgin before his birth, a virgin in his birth, and a virgin after his birth? Which is, in fact, what the, what the church has solemnly uh, defined. So all of these Old Testament passages were always understood in the early church as teaching the perpetual virginity of Mary. And I have to respectfully disagree with something that Mr. Svensson said. I will, uh, I will challenge him now very strongly to produce one church father, one church father, that does deny the perpe- perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, there were heretics in the early church that denied it, but no one that is considered a church father. And he he mentioned, in fact, I have to take strong exception to St. Irenaeus. I would like to hear the quote from St. Irenaeus in which St. Irenaeus denies the perpetual virginity of Mary. Because on the contrary, St. Irenaeus clearly affirmed it, and I will show you that uh, if if I can get to that. Now, what the Old Testament prophesies and portrays in type and in prophecy, the New Testament reveals in several uh, scenes. I'll only mention two. In the Annunciation, which I've already alluded to, when the Archangel Gabriel appears to Mary uh, and tells her that she'll be the mother of the Messiah, she says in Luke 1.34, How shall this happen, since I do not know man, since I am a virgin? It's the present tense. The angel had said, you will conceive, future tense. And Mary's question makes no sense if she is merely saying that she had been a virgin at that point in her life, and that um, the only impediment to future pregnancy would be in ongoing virginity, a lifelong virginity. In other words, if the angel says, look, you've been a virgin up till now, but you will conceive and have a child, she was engaged to Joseph. If she intended to have relations with Joseph, she wouldn't have been perplexed. She would have thought, well, okay, we're going to get married, we're going to have relations, and I will conceive in the normal course of operations and have a child. This makes perfect sense. Mary understood, as everyone understands, how she can become a mother by ceasing to be a virgin. What she couldn't understand is how she could become a mother while remaining a virgin. Hence her perplexity. And the angel says that her virginity is not something that will have to be yielded, have to be given up or surrendered by Mary. In fact, um, scholars have pointed out very well, I don't have it here, it is. If, in fact, the angel's, um, if the angel's question means what um, Mr. Svensson thinks it means, then actually we have a rather outrageous um, uh, significance to that. His interpretation of Mary's question can only mean that Mary felt that the angel, in foretelling her pregnancy, was accusing her of having already lost her virginity, which is outrageous. That Mary would think that an angel from heaven would, would be saying, uh, this is how, uh, this is why you will give birth to a child, that you, you are already, uh, you've violated virginity. She says, how can it be? I am a virgin. What Our Lady testifies to in her words in Luke 1, uh, 
34 is made clear by a later statement in Scripture. Let me give you an analogy for that, by the way. Suppose someone said to you, um, the prophet said to you, you will die of lung cancer. And you said, how can this be since I do not smoke? You will bear a son in the future, Gabriel said to her. How can this be since I am a virgin? That defines who I am. That's my status. That's my vocation. How can I ever conceive in the future? If she intended to give up her virginity, then the fact that she would in the future bear a son wouldn't have been a puzzling or perplexing thing. And I'm sure Mrs. Benson will want to come back to this um, passage, but the fact is, I have wrestled around and around this passage. There is no way to make sense of Mary's question unless we understand her to be expressing the fact that she is called to be a virgin. Not that she simply happens to have been a virgin up to that particular point. The other scene I only have time to bring us to is at the end of our Lord's uh, earthly ministry, as this is the beginning of it in his conception. And that is in John 19, 26, when our Lord makes a legal disposition of Our Lady, when he's hanging from the cross in John 19, 26, and says, Woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. In fact, entrusts her not to any apostle, but to the one apostle who was a virgin himself, the apostle John. Our Lord would have been violating the non-transferable legal obligation of flesh and blood sons to care for their uh, parent that the, that the commandment requires if he had taken her out of the hands of her son and put her in the hands of a man who was uh, not her son. And Mr. Spencer might say, well, but the sons of Mary weren't, weren't believers at that point. But they, they are, by his own admission in his own book, a few days later, in, at the time of when they're praying for the coming of the gift of, of the Spirit of Pentecost, didn't Jesus know that they would convert? If these brothers of Jesus that we see are now believers in the church in Acts 1 and following uh, are indeed the siblings, the actual flesh and blood children of Mary, they are not her children. She is undergoing the grief that Hosea predicted, the grief of a mother for the death of her only son. And so her only son, in the midst of his grief, places Our Lady in the safekeeping of uh, St. John to prove that she has, in fact, no other uh, people who have that legal obligation. Our Lord takes care of her. So here we see some positive indications, and I'm out of time. I'll, um, I'll continue uh, next time up to that, I guess. Hang in there. Okay. So the second rebuttal begins with uh, Professor Spencer. This rebuttal will be 10 minutes of length for each participant. <clears throat> Such a matter of success for one church father who did not believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. I'll give you... Uh, two or three here. Ignatius, regarding his phrase, Mysteries of Renown, in his letter to the Ephesians, says, The virginity of Mary was hidden from the prince of the world as also her offspring and the death of the Lord. Most scholars take this to, meet, to be in a sequ sequential way. Uh, the virginity of Mary, and then her offspring, and then the death, in that order. Uh, mother uh, mentions James, the Lord's brother, Adolphus, and Jude, who is said, who, quote, is said to have been the Lord's brother, Autophos, according to the flesh, quote, uh, end quote, as well as Simeon, the son of Clophus, whom Hegesippus calls the cousin, Onesios, of the Lord. The, fact that the master tape was damaged at this point, but we were able to recover the words. Uh, Mr. Swenson said, two relationships, the use of Autophos, biological siblings in mind. Irenaeus says, this and as the protoplast Adam had his substance from untilled and as yet virgin soil. We now continue with the Master. Substance from untilled and as yet virgin soil, for God had not yet sent rain, and man had not yet tilled the ground, and was formed by the hand of God, that is, by the word of God, for all things were made through him. Uh, so did he who is the word, recapitulating Adam in himself, rightly receive a birth, enabling him to gather up Adam unto himself from Mary, who was as yet a virgin. In the same way that the soil was as yet a virgin, but was then tilled afterwards, so Mary was as yet a virgin, but then wasn't afterwards. Uh, Mr. Matatix also uh, referred to the gate, uh, Ezekiel 44. Mentioned Ezekiel 44 refers to a gate that is shut, and no one except for the prince can enter it because God has entered it. Uh, and he mentioned that Mary is the final reference to this, or at least uh, symbolic of it. But what prevents me from postulating that since the believer is the true temple of God under the new covenant, that this refers instead to the believer? And the fact that no one else can enter it means that no evil spirits may possess a true believer. I can just make it up as I go. 
Or what prevents the Mormon from postulating that the two sticks that we find in Ezekiel that represent Ephraim and Judah are not actually the Bible and the Book of Mormon? And that's exactly what they do argue, based on that same kind of interpretation. This method of interpretation is too subjective, folks. There are no parameters to guard against the imaginations of man to keep them in check. Cults use this kind of interpretation all the time to come up with all kinds of heresies. But the fact that Mr. Matatix even uses this as an argument does indicate one thing. It indicates that he has no real evidence for his belief. He's shown you his cards. He's laid them on the table. He's shown them to you. That's all he's got. He doesn't have anything more. The image of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, Mr. Matatix pointed out. Uh, he didn't delve into it uh, very much, but I will. Um, it's based on the word episkiazo, uh, which is used both in, uh, the, in Luke and in uh, Exodus. But this word is also used in other contexts. For instance, Mount Zion, Isaiah 4, 5. Why isn't, why isn't Mary Mount Zion? It's used of Israel in Numbers 24, 6. Uh, the word without the preposition of compound is used of Benjamin in Deuteronomy 33. It's used of the plant that grew over Jonah's head in Jonah it's four six. Why isn't Mary the plant that grew over Ju Jonah's head? Why arbitrarily pick the Ark of the Covenant? The statement of David in Second Samuel six nine, which is uh, often paralleled with Elizabeth's statement, "How can the Lord, Ark of the Lord ever come to me?" is different uh, because the Ark did not immediately go to David as uh, it did if Mary is the Ark to Elizabeth, but was taken to the house of Obed Edom for three months. And David's words are said in frustration, whereas Elizabeth's words are stated in humility. And Mary did stay with her three months. So there's a difference, not only in the intent of the saying, but also just where the ark stayed in relation to the speaker. Uh, Mr. Magic also mentioned the vow of virginity, Luke 134. Uh, this is the only real attempt at exegesis that Mr. Magic has made tonight, but even here his attempt failed. Mary understands the angel to mean that she would conceive immediately, or at least before she and Joseph came together as husband and wife. Notice in this passage, Mary does not say, how can this be, since I will never know a man, or since I will not know a man, which is what we might expect if Mary had taken a lifelong, or a vow of lifelong virginity. Instead, he says, how can this be, since I am not, present tense, I am not knowing a man. The present tense, not the future is used in the statement. Mary could not fathom how she was going to become pregnant right now or in the immediate future, since she was not currently having sexual relations with a man, nor did she foresee that in the future. Catholic apologists often argue that the present tense here is used as a futuristic present. That is, a present tense that refers to the future. While a futuristic present is certainly a legitimate concept in Greek syntax, it is not legitimate here. If you want a legitimate futuristic present, all you have to do is turn to the 14th chapter of John, which contains several of them. Uh, for instance, in 14, 2 and 3 we read, I am going to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I am coming again to take you with me. Both the phrases, I am going and I am coming, are present tense verbs, but both are unambiguously future referring. The way to test whether a present tense verb is a true futuristic uh, present is to translate it as a present and to see if it makes good sense in its context as a present. If it makes sense as a present referring verb, then it is not a legitimate futuristic present. Mary's statement in Luke 1.34 does not pass that test, folks. For the phrase, I do not know a man, makes perfectly good sense as a present referring verb. She is not currently knowing a man, and she didn't uh, anticipate knowing a man for quite some time. She was betrothed, but it was only the first step of the betrothal. She hadn't, not, hadn't yet been married. Aside from this, uh, Mr. Mavsitz has introduced a, a, a historical novum, namely that there was such a thing as a married virgin. Such a notion cannot be supported either biblically or historically. It's, it's a common uh, claim by Catholic apologists to assert that Mary and Joseph married for financial expediency or to keep other suitors away from Mary. But, and I know Mr. Matrix is not going to accept these, but Catholic New Testament scholar George Maloney, whatever the later apocryphal gospels may have made of this relationship, there are no indications that the Lucan text had any vow to perpetual virginity. Anthony Tembasco, who is also a Catholic, and by the way, these are the majority Catholic, this is the majority view of Catholic New Testament scholarship, folks. This is not just a handful of scholars. If it were that bad, why hasn't Rome censured them? Catholic scholar Anthony Tabasco, quote, despite the continued defense by exegetes, 
to promote the affirmative position, more and more biblicists agree that Mary did not make a vow of perpetual virginity. Moreover, a, a, a married virgin is biblically, biblically untenable. There is never any, any hint in the New Testament or the Old Testament that it is acceptable to be married at the same time a virgin. In fact, Paul gives this just the opposite directive in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you uh, read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he tells us that while it is ideal to remain unmarried, so that one can better serve the Lord, this would be impractical for those not having the gift, verses 7 through 9. However, if one does not marry, that person has a merit, or if one does marry, rather, that person has a marital debt. Verse 3, the Greek word translated debt in that passage is aphelain, and means that which is owed. Namely, not to deprive the spouse of his or her body, which by virtue of marriage no longer belongs to him or her, but to the spouse, verses 4 and 5. Paul would like unmarried widows and virgins to remain unmarried, but the passion clear if they too should marry. Now, several points can be made about Paul's words here. First, it is clear by these passages that Paul assumes that if one is married, he or she is also sexually active. Second, Paul maintains that if one is not sexually active uh, within a marriage, that person is depriving his or her, her spouse of what is owed, a failing. Moreover, if one wants to live a life of sexual inactivity and undistracted devotion to the Lord, that person is to remain agamas, unmarried, not to marry for financial expediency. Marriage between two avowed virgins violates the divinely instituted intent of marriage, which is to demonstrate the intimate relationship between Christ and his church, Ephesians 5, 22 through 32. To marry for any other reason is to pervert that original intent and to shamefully cheapen the marriage relationship. Intentional, unconsummated marriage, therefore, is not only unbiblical, but in fact anti-biblical. This is marriage practice, and marriage is open to these charges. Thank you very much. Mr. Svensson wants to know why so many modern Catholic scripture scholars could be saying things and getting away with exegetical murder, things that contradict what the church has solemnly defined in the past. Well, that's because we live in an age of apostasy, Mr. Svensson, and I'll be the first to admit that, and I'll be talking all about that tomorrow in Sacramento. Mr. Svensson's final section of his rebuttal period here um, made a lot of hay of the fact that Jerry Maddox is introducing a historical novum, that is some novelty, some new thing, the idea of a woman wanting to get married and yet remain a virgin her entire life. Mr. Svensson, let me remind you, it is God Almighty himself who introduced the historical novum. It is a new thing for a virgin to become a mother. I know that you believe that the incarnation is unique. It is a unique situation. God does not become man except in this one instance. So, of course, the birth of Jesus Christ is unique. Of course, his mother is unique. Only one woman out of all the women who have walked the face of this earth was selected to be simultaneously a virgin and a mother and to bear God within her. Only one woman's body had the privilege of being a tabernacle for Emmanuel, God with us, within her. So it seems rather odd to say, now wait a minute, you can't start saying there's something special about Mary, something special about her marriage, something special about her relationship with, with, with St. Joseph. This is nothing but special, ladies and gentlemen. There's something pretty special about God becoming man. It doesn't happen every day. It only happened once. And of course, we are led by the uniqueness of the Incarnation to say what other special ramifications of this would there be in the life of the mother of God in the flesh. Mr. Svensson said, there are church fathers who deny the perfection of virginity of Mary. I will still respectfully contest that. Tertullian is not a church father. He left the church and became a heretic and a schismatic by joining the Montanists. No, I know you didn't. I didn't, I didn't say that you did. I'm simply pointing out that, that Tertullian is not a church father. And he is the only one that Catholic apologists do quote uh, as, as evidence that there were church fathers. St. Ignatius of Antioch defends the perpetual virginity of Mary in his epistle to the Ephesians. St. Irenaeus defends against Jovinian the idea that Mary ever ceased to be a virgin in his against heresies. Um, and I will, um, and again, encourage uh, Mr. Svensson to look carefully at the passage that he's quoted. To, to quote Ignatius of Antioch as saying that she was as yet a virgin and say, oh, then he must believe that she ceased to be a virgin at that point, is to 
argue in circles is to read into this statement of St. Ignatius of Antioch the same significance he reads into, say, St. Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. People who have studied the doctrine of the Church Fathers on this point uh, tell us that there is unanimity among them. For example, one of the standard works of Mariology is a three-volume set by uh, Father Juniper Carroll, Fundamentals of Mariology, and he says in that on page 149, quote, there are few Catholic dogmas, he admits, there are few Catholic dogmas which can claim the unanimous support of tradition, with as much right as the dogma now under discussion. Uh, to wit, the professional virginity of Mary. The fact is that not one single father of the church can be quoted as bearing witness against it. He goes on to say, on page 153, quote, the belief in Mary's perpetual virginity, which necessarily includes her virginity after the birth of Christ, has been so deeply rooted in Catholic tradition from the very beginning. The fathers of the church instinctively and vigorously rose to its defense every time it was questioned by early heretics, unquote. If it was a historical fact, Mr. Svensson, that Mary had other children, people would have known. And the doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity would not have been able to get off the ground without people saying, wait a minute, here is a child of Mary, here's a son that she had, here's a daughter that she had, you can't preach that she's perpetually a virgin. And nobody comes forward with children of Mary as, as, as proof against her perpetual virginity except heretics like Helvidius and Jovinian people who were not church fathers, not even Catholics in good standing. They were the Hans Kungs of their day. Mary is constantly referred to in the liturgy, in the prayers of the church, uh, by the title, the ever-virgin, a parthenos, in the present tense. The Apostles' Creed, which embodies the teaching of Christ's apostles, says that he was born of the Virgin Mary, that she was a virgin even in the act of giving birth. And then this ancient expression, Mary ever-virgin, uh, it shows up in all these early creeds. The symbol of Epiphanius in the 4th century is inserted officially in the creed by the Second Council of Constantinople, which is the Fifth Ecumenical Council in the year 553. Uh, and it was solemnly defined uh, by a whole variety of popes that I could quote here, a whole variety of uh, ecumenical councils, the First Lateran Council, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, the Third Council of Constantinople in 681. And the church is always solemnly defined. It's just pick up any copy of Denzinger's Sources of Catholic Dogma, Turn to the Perfection of Mary in the Index, and you will see that the Church has mustered its full magisterial authority to say we hereby solemnly declare, define, and pronounce that Mary was always virgin throughout her entire life. And it is based upon the teaching, the unanimous teaching of the Church Fathers that are then quoted by all the popes and quoted by the ecumenical councils as reasons they give for defending the perpetual virginity of Mary. St. Irenaeus, St. Basil the Great, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. John Chrysostom, St. Ephraim, all of these men affirm the perpetual virginity of Mary. Now, the, now the, the reason they're relevant for a discussion of scripture is I believe that it's at least uh, the, the act of a modest man to say, as we approach scripture and seek to interpret it, how did the people to whom the scripture first came interpret these passages? How did they interpret Isaiah 7:14? How did they interpret Ezekiel 44, verse 2? How did they interpret Our, Our, Our Lady's words, How can it be since I am a virgin in, in Luke 1:43? How did they interpret what Our Lord did from the cross in John 19:25? And the fact is they all interpreted these, sta these statements of Scripture as, as expressing and as demonstrating the perpetual virginity of Mary. If we're going to come along 2,000 years later and say, Hey, they didn't have the Logos Bible software. So they can't really know what the verse said. Even those poor slobs 500 years ago, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, they didn't have the computers we've got now. Falls into what C.S. Lewis, a Protestant apologist, condemned as the heresy of modern regression that says, only we moderns really understand reality. This is to now make truth held hostage by every new advance in so-called cutting-edge critical scholarship. We can never know what the Bible teaches them because next year we'll have a new software or a better computer program or some new scholar pushing the envelope even further and daring to, to uh, this, is, this is not the instinct of the Christian who says what Jesus taught, what was true in historically of Mary, what the apostles taught is something that Christians can know in every age. This is a tradition that has been passed on down from generation to generation, shows up in creed after creed, council after council, pope after pope. Church Father, Church Father, commentary after commentary. And we don't need to, to avail ourselves of 20th century technology to at last ascertain what all these people were confused about in all these previous periods. No, uh, that is not the way truth works. Truth can be known in the first century, in the second century, in the third century, and on down by listening 
to the constant teaching of the, the church fathers, the recipients of these inspired intimate documents. How did they interpret them? Because they weren't simply sent it anonymously in the mail. They received, they were the beneficiaries of the personal instruction of the people who wrote these books. St. Timothy didn't just receive the two epistles of St. Paul and had to figure out for himself what St. Paul meant. He had been personally tutored by St. Paul, who can refer to St. Timothy as my true son in the faith. The successors to the apostles, in other words, were the recipients of the hermeneutical context, the interpretive context. And Mr. Uh, Svensson can say, Jerry, Jerry, you know, we can't have this subjective interpretation. But I would totally agree with them and say that actually the shoe unfortunately fits the other foot this evening. Because to me it seems the most subjective interpretation is to discount what, even if he does not believe, let's, let me stipulate for the sake of argument that there's not a unanimity. Mr. Spencer would have to historically be honest and say that the vast majority, even if he can quote one church father here or one over there, the vast majority taught the perfection of Mary. And if we want to be objective in our interpretation of scripture, we should follow what there is this long pedigree, what the near unanimity, if not the total unanimity, even if I grant him that point, has to say on the issue. To say, no, we're going to, we're going to look at these things with the ad advances of new Greek scholarship and, and, and overthrow what the 2000 year teaching of the church has been on this. That is truly subjective. For any individual, Jerry Matatix, Eric Svensson, or anybody to go off and say, this is what I think these passages mean when we are fallible men. Now we come to the most exciting part of the evening. Each participant will have ten minutes in which to cross-examine his opponent. Eric will have the first at bat and will begin right now. Ms. Matrix, can you cite one passage in the New Testament or in the literature contemporaneous to the New Testament where Adolphos or Adolphe bears the meaning close relative? Adolphos or Adolphe, a feminine? Um, well, I already mentioned St. John chapter 19, verse 25, where it mentions uh, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, who's referred to as the Adolphe of Mary. Sister. Well, that's, of course, what we're debating. Yes, yeah, do you have one unambiguous instance where we can both agree that this means close relative and not sister? I would say that the more, if you want to talk about more likely interpretations, as you have a longer than the natural interpretation, it would be more natural to assume that Mary's parents, even if we didn't know from tradition Mary had been an only child, if you discount that, leave that out of the picture, it's highly unlikely that this other woman named Mary would be her sibling, that the, that the parents would give two girls in the same family the same name. Mr. Matthews, where is Mary, wife of Clopas, called Jesus' mother's sister? She's called the... Uh, John 19.25. Are you, are you inferring from that text that there are three women there rather than four? No, I'm not inferring from that text. That's the way the text has been historically understood. The three Marys at the foot of the cross is how all the commentaries... Um, describe the scene at the foot of the cross. So, so who are the women at the cross, Mr. Mantix? In John 19.25? Yes. I'll read it. And I'll read it from the New International Version, an evangelical translation. Quote, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Those are the, quote, three Marys that are referred to in the, the tradition, the, the, the history of interpretation of the Gospels, the, the accounts of the Passion. Mr. Matthews, are you aware that most scholars see four women here and not three? Am I aware that most scholars see four? No, I'm not. You're not aware of that? No. Um, Mr. Matthews, do you mean most scholars living today, or do you mean most scholars in the history of interpretation? Well, most scholars today, but I'd I'd be interested to see if they outnumber the scholars, if the older scholars outnumber the ones today. But Mr. Matthews, is uh, in Matthew and Mark, you admit that that, uh, Mary was at the cross. Where is she in Matthew and Mark's accounts? I don't understand what you mean. Mary was at the cross, you agree. Which Mary are we speaking of? Mary, Jesus' mother. Yes. Where is she in Matthew and Mark's account? Where is she in Matthew and Mark's account? Right, Matthew 27, Mark 15, where is she? Uh, It may not specific, something doesn't have to be specifically mentioned in every gospel for us to know that it was a historical event. But we know she was there. 
Well, we know it from St. John's account. Oh, from St. John. Uh, Mr. Mantis, how is it conceivable that Matthew and Mark would have left out the second most important person in the universe, besides, uh, aside from Jesus Christ himself, the second most important person in the universe, how could she have been left out of this and, and in, in her place have included Mary, the mother of James and Joseph? Some insignificant woman that never shows up again in any significant way? You're, you're making an argument from silence. You're saying that if St. Matthew and St. Mark don't mention Mary, the mother of Jesus, that we must assume that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the same as Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. That they had some obligation to, to mention every significant detail. But the fact is, every Protestant and Catholic commentator admits that you have to piece all the Gospels together to get a full understanding of whether there were two angels at the tomb at the resurrection or one. In other words, no evangelist feels constrained to bear the burden of, of describing every significant detail. But, but they would include the insignificant Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, but, but omit for some reason Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay, the we'll fact that they that. include Mary, the mother of Jesus and Joseph indicates it's not insignificant. She is not mentioned in any significant way in the New Testament, and you're, you're comparing her to Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, who, in your view, is very significant. It seems odd that uh, she would be excluded from Matthew's account and, and Mark's account if, if we know she was there. No, I'm just saying if someone is named... Let, let me just go on. Go ahead. Uh, you can't cite an unambiguous instance of auto thoughts or auto faith that bears the meaning that you need to see in the New Testament. Can you cite one passage in the New Testament or in the literature surrounding the New Testament where the phrase teos who bears the meaning that you need to mean in Matthew 125? Apart from Matthew 125? Yes. Prescending from the disputed passage, can you cite any passage? In the New Testament. In the New Testament or in the literature in the two centuries surrounding the birth of Christ. Why do you, why do you become the arbiter of setting the parameters and saying it's got to be the two centuries or right around the time of Christ? Why, well, why we, need, we, need, we need some kind of parameters, Mr. Magic, and we need some kind of usage. You establish usage by uh, looking at okay. uh, how it's used in that era. Fair point. What's the Septuagint being used by the early church? As their Old Testament, yes or no? Yes. Okay, so I can cite the Septuagint as an example of contemporaneous usage, can I not? No, no, that's not contemporary usage. In the, we, we use the, several people use the King James Version. The word let in Second Thessalonians means to hinder or forbid rather than to allow as it does now. That doesn't mean that establishes the meaning for today. So can you, can you cite a passage that establishes the meaning for the New Testament era? The, I'm, where heos who means what it must mean in Matthew 125 for your position to be true. My point is that the Septuagint does provide a normative force for the way words are being used. Dramatics, words and phrases change. Certainly. The etym etymology of words and phrases change all the time as a matter of course. So what I'm asking for is, can, if Matthew uses it in Matthew 125 for that way, can you cite one other instance where the New Testament writers use it in that way? I have, um, I'm sorry I can't find it here. I have, not off the top of my head, no. I oh, do okay. have a okay. transcript for, of you and David Palm going through all the occurrences, and I, if I could lay my hands oh, on it, I could. No, that was heos. I'm saying heos who. That was heos who. That was simply heos, all those heos, heos all those. You were, your, your, your question back then was, can you name an instance where heos is used as a conjunction? And I listed okay. 15 of them. Okay. Okay, Mr. Mr. Matichik, uh do you believe that uh, Peter's mother-in-law had a daughter? Do I believe that Peter's mother-in-law had a Correct. daughter? Do you believe Peter's mother-in-law had a daughter? I have to be honest and admit I've never given it any thought. But can we infer it safely from the text? That Peter's mother-in-law had a daughter. Right. How do we help me in, infer it from the text? Or what, it's, what a pretty easy say, it's a pretty easy question, Mr. Manatee. Did Peter's mother-in-law have a daughter? Well, obviously the wife... Peter had a mother-in-law. Did that mother-in-law have a daughter? Yeah, that's not an inference. I'm saying that's... I don't understand your, your question. Okay, you asked... Peter, Peter married somebody. You asked earlier... And he married it, a woman. You asked earlier whether there was a passage that specifically names, or specifically says, Mary had other children. But we do have passages where Jesus is said to have brothers. We have passages where Jesus is said to have a mother. We naturally infer from that that the mother of Jesus and the brother of Jesus have the same... Uh, son, daughter, or son, uh, mother relationship. Only in the same way, in the same way that Peter, Peter we infer from uh, Peter having a mother-in-law and having a wife. We don't need the New Testament, for, uh, uh, in other words, to tell us specifically every conceivable way that a relationship might uh, uh, be in, in existence. We don't need it to say Peter, Peter's mother-in-law had other children. 
And one of those children was a daughter, and that daughter married Peter. We don't need to say that because we can infer from the common relationship with Peter, can't we? But there's no analogy. This doesn't help your position at all. It does help my position because you're saying that we, we, we require uh, a, a passage that says specifically Mary had other children. But that would be like requiring a passage that says Peter's mother-in-law had other children before we could believe that there was a daughter-mother relationship with Peter's wife and Peter's mother-in-law. The reason the analogy doesn't hold is because Peter has to marry a woman. So, of course, his mother-in-law would have to have a daughter. Right. But the word of Delphos, both sides agree, even though you don't think it's relevant in these instances, can be used, has been used, both in a broader and a narrower sense. So we're not necessarily driven to the conclusion in what age. If, if we're told that Jesus had brothers, therefore we don't need a statement that Mary had children that can only be interpreted in that one way. Can you cite one instance where Adolphus or Adolphe is used that way in the New Testament era? The, the very instances that we're debating, yes. Yeah, no. Uh, Presenting from the d disputed passages, can you cite one instance so that we can establish mm -hmm. the usage? You can't establish the usage from the disputed text. You, you are aware of, of course. that. You need to have, there are thousands upon thousands of instances of autophos in that literature, Mr. Mantis. You can't produce even one? Actually, I, let me take back what I just uh, conceded. You can establish usage from a text when you look at how that text is understood. Yes, and is there something in the context that leads you to believe that uh, these were cousins or close relatives rather than siblings? Yes, the context of the historical fact that the early church believed that Mary didn't have other children. Just so I can understand your position, Mr. Svensson, you are saying then that um, Mary, the wife of Clopas, mentioned in John 19.25, is, uh, who is mentioned as the sister of our Lord, you believe that she was her strict sibling. You believe that, no, no, I don't. The sister that's mentioned is not named in, in John uh, 19. Let me look up here. Okay, so you believe there are two different women there. There are four different women in John's account, John 19, 25. All right, all right, that's fine. That's all I need to know. You agree, Mr. Svensson, that Mary was a virgin, at least up to a certain point in her life. Yes. And you believe that she didn't remain a virgin perfectly, so that she, therefore, lost or yielded up her virginity at some particular point. Yes. Let's establish where that point was. Did Mary lose her virginity in the act of giving birth to Jesus? Uh, I'm not going to argue that. Uh, she may well have. I mean, there are scholars on the Catholic side who will point to passages that uh, that argue against uh, virginity in partu uh, are you, during the birth. Of are you aware? Are you aware to the fact? I'm not asking you to, whether you agree with it. Are you aware of the fact, Mr. Svensson, that the Church has dogmatically defined that Mary remained a virgin in partu? But that is as much a dogmatic fact from the Catholic perspective as her virginity before the birth and after the birth of Jesus. Are you aware of that? Uh, yes, I'm aware that okay. you're understanding then, that passage. Then for you to cite Catholic scholars who deny that gets us right back to the Hans Kungs and the people who really don't care what the church is dogmatically defined. In answer to your question, the, um, the point at which I would define virginity lost is the point at which someone has sexual relations. I'm not really all that concerned about the birth of Christ and, and whether or not uh, the virginity was lost during the birth of Christ. Even though the church, the Catholic church, has said there is theological significance to this. No, it doesn't, it doesn't concern me. Why would that concern me? Well, I can understand we, why. We, we see Jesus' brothers and sisters. We see biological siblings in the New Testament of Jesus. It was at that point, uh, it was after the until was reached in Matthew 125, that uh, Mary's virginity was lost. So when you said earlier, when I asked you in the course of this debate, if you believe in the virgin birth of Christ, and you say now, it doesn't concern me whether she was a virgin in the act of the birth or not, you're taking back what you saw no, that, earlier. Clearly, the point of the virgin birth is that she had no sexual relations with a man and that this son was the son of the Most High, not of a man. But that's, that's the point of the virgin that's birth. That's the virginal Mr. conception. Madison. That's the virginal conception, not the virgin birth. Well, the virgin birth. Do, you understand the difference between conception and the, right. that which happens right. nine months right. later, the birth. It, because it So you believe he, in the virginal conception, but I, not in the virgin no, birth. No, of course I believe in the virgin birth. Matthew 125 even says it. It says he kept her virgin until she gave birth to a son. Okay. So she remained a virgin in the act of giving birth to Jesus. Yes or no? Fine. I, I'll, I'll concede that point. Okay. But it's important. Well, to, I, I'm not sure where you're I, going with this, but... Uh, I just want to understand what your faith is about My faith is that birth. Mary lost her virginity when in, in the act of sexual relations with Joseph. Okay, so and that, according to your 
reconstruction of the history happened after the birth of Jesus. According so she, to my reconstruction of history, you mean according to the lexical and philological evidence of heos who and the normal use of the word brother? What I'm saying, what I'm getting at, Mr. Spencer, is that you don't have any statement in Scripture, do you, that tells us when Joseph began to have relations with Mary? No, we have the grown children as proof, though, so it doesn't really matter when it happened. Well, that's arguing in a circle. No, it's not. The normal usage of Adolphos is brother. It doesn't describe those children as having been fathered by Joseph, does it? No, it could have been somebody else, but, but they were Jesus' biological brothers. And we know that Joseph had nothing to do with that. And it doesn't... You know, Mary was the only parent, the true biological parent of Jesus. And so they must have been children of Mary. Well, again, that's begging the question. I'm not mean, begging the question, Mr. Madison. It's, 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 it's the that's normal right. usage of the words, and you are unable to produce even one instance that is an exception to that rule. But the normal phrase that would clinch it, you would agree, would be the phrase, children of Mary. They are not no, identified. No, that, no, I don't agree with that. I, any more than we would have to have a statement that says that Peter's mother-in-law had children. I just argue that point. Why do you think, Mr. Spencer, that in the history of the church, Mary is spoken of as always virgin? Or simply, even if you leave out the word always, just sticking with the phrase, the Virgin Mary, in the Apostles' Creed, that he was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. Let me ask you an analogy, just to, so you can understand my question. If, if I had in my, in my family a bachelor uncle, and uh, a man who had, you know, never, never gotten married, and then at some particular point he did get married, so he ceased to be a bachelor, we wouldn't refer to him as the bachelor uncle the rest of our life. And yet Mary is referred to in the early church, every time she shows up in the Creed, as the Virgin Mary. And yet your your um, postulate is that she ceased to be a virgin at a certain point. Why does she go on being referred to as the Virgin Mary the rest, the rest of uh, theological uh, enterprise then? Well, Mr. Madison, even the New Testament uses that kind of uh, phraseology with John the Baptist. Is John still baptizing in heaven? Of course he's not still baptizing in heaven. Of course he's not, but he's called John the Baptist in the New Testament, isn't he? Because that was the function that he had during exactly the right. That was life. the function of Mary for her earthly ministry uh, is to, to, bring forth, up, uh, to, to bring forth the Christ in a virginal way. But John was a Baptist throughout his entire ministry until he died. You're not, you don't believe that Mary was a virgin until she died. But that's what she's known for in the same way that John the Baptist is known for baptizing. Why wouldn't she simply be known for being the mother of Jesus rather than having been she is known as the mother of Jesus? And, and we're not debating, uh, 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 you know, unless you're changing the parameters of debate, we're debating what the Bible teaches, not what church history teaches. But my point is that, and, and besides that, the term ever virgin came into existence around the fourth century. So if you have a, a, an example of, of it being used, say, in the second century, so we can establish some kind of line of, uh, of uh, succession of this so-called tradition, uh, then that would be another matter. And we can debate that, and I'd be glad to debate that with you, but not tonight. Uh, you made the point several times this evening that uh, it, was, it would have been silly or, or inappropriate, or in fact even anti-biblical, for Mary to want to be married for any other reason than to have sexual relations with Joseph. No, that's not what I said. Well, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but what I'm saying is it would have been unbiblical for you to phrase very badly. Well, let me rephrase it then in a way that might be more acceptable to you. You're saying it would have been anti-biblical for Mary to want to be married while at the same time having the intention to remain a virgin her entire right. life. Yes. In other words, that, that the, the enjoyment of the sexual union between them is of such is, is so much of the essence of the marriage that she would have been committing an act of injustice to St. Joseph and he to her, presumably, for them not to abstain from sexual relations during their entire married existence. It, 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 is, uh, it perverts the original intent of the marriage, as I said earlier, to... Uh, but you agree... The intimate relationship between Christ and his church. But you agree... There is a marital debt. You, you agree, off failing is used in that passage, don't you? Yes, but I also agree that in Scripture, there are many situations in which debts are are not claimed. I mean, the, the, the parables of the kingdom uh, tell us quite a bit about that. My point is simply that if the Incarnation is a unique event, if Mary's motherhood was uniquely consecrated to be the mother of God the Son, to bring him forth, isn't it at least conceivable to you, just conceivable to you, you don't have to concede the point, that Having been set apart from all eternity for this special ministry to be the one who would bring the, the, the human body, the human nature of God into the world, that that vocation would suffice and that it would be retrogressive, it would be, it would be slumming from that point for her to now bring sinful children into the world and that she could have a legitimate need for marriage if God so willed so that, number one, Christ would have a legal claim to the throne of David 
by virtue of its foster father. That's clearly the point of the genealogy of St. Matthew, and that the Holy Family would have a protector, someone who would provide, someone who could rescue uh, Mary from Herod's threat, take them into Egypt, work with his hands to provide for the Holy Family, so she wouldn't have to work, and the baby certainly can't work as a baby. But can't you see other, other benefits to marriage besides the enjoyment of sexual union? Well, of course there are other benefits to marriage, but that is an integral part of it, and it is a marital debt, Paul says. But it this is a unique family. situation. You would agree. I'm sorry? This is a unique situation. You do agree. The incarnation, the Holy Family, it's a unique family in the history of the world. Yes, that and part so, of it is so, unique, but you're reading into the uniqueness. You're, you're, going, you're embellishing the uniqueness, and you're, you're operating from a theological construct no, that I don't agree with. No, I'm not embellishing, I'm not foisting, to use the word you like to use. I'm simply asking you, isn't it conceivable that in the uniqueness of the Holy Family situation, something that you and I might consider a, quote, normal part of our married state would not be essentially required for that marriage to be a full, valid, and practical, and useful marriage to fulfill purposes of God without having to... It was not God's purpose for Mary, having produced God, to produce sinful human children after him. Mr. Magic, it would be conceivable only on two, on two conditions. conditions. It would be conceivable if the Scripture didn't command otherwise in 1 Corinthians 7, and the Scripture did indicate otherwise in the case of Mary's professional virginity, and it does not. First Corinthians 7 commands Mary to have relations? Commands, commands there to be uh, sexual relations and there is a marital debt. Okay. Put back the bat. Okay, um, we're now going to enter our closing arguments and uh, each, each of the participants will have 15 minutes to do so. Mr. Svensson will be first. Jerry said that the, the truth doesn't change, and he's right, it doesn't change. But the Jews of Jesus' day thought they had the truth as well. They thought they had kept it for much longer than 2,000 years. Much longer than 2,000 years. He said that some in the Roman Catholic Church have apostatized, and we're in the age of an apostasy. Some of us believe the apostasy occurred a long, long time ago. And that's why we're here tonight. One theologian says, the most important fruit of a Protestant contribu contribution to this issue is that behind the rank foliage of a mystical and uncontrolled Mariology, the real picture of our Lord's Mother would be revealed in a new astringency, simplicity, and beauty. Mary must be defended from becoming the product of our pious imagination. This is Maren Gottfried, who is, again, a Catholic scholar in his work on uh, Mary and the Churches. This is what I've tried to do tonight, folks. I have tried to present Mary in her true simplicity. Her true beauty, stripped of all man-made embellishments and traditions. Folks, I have no desire to disparage Mary. Evangelical Protestants have no desire to disparage Mary. We honor Mary in the same way the New Testament does. She is, she is blessed. Uh, all nations will call her blessed. That's true. She had a role to play in the New Testament. She bore the, 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 the Son of God. She had the privilege, the unique privilege of raising him. She was a disciple of Jesus Christ. She is a sister in the faith. But she is not honored by attributing to her what is not true. She is truly honored only when she is presented in the way the New Testament presents her. That it is no secret that the Roman Catholic teacher regarding Mary's perpetual virginity is so clearly at odds with the biblical data is pointed out by uh, scholar Kerry Borison, who writes, quote, the main problem with Catholic discourse about Mary is the disparity between the biblical data and the doctrinal inter interpretation put on it, end quote. Echoing the sentiment, John McKenzie says, quote, the Mary of Christian legend, art, poetry, hymnody, and even theology is a fictitious character. Faith in the Mary of traditional Christian devotion is faith in something which is not true. So at odds with the spiritual evidence is it that one begins to wonder how this belief ever surfaced in the first place. Any confusion on this, however, is at once cleared up when one begins to investigate the historical background of this teaching. Catholic New Testament scholar John McKenzie again puts it this way, quote, at this point, the student begins to sense the possible influence of some form of Gnosticism. And he does not have to appeal to the arguments of theological priority to know that in the early Christianity, there were forms of Gnosticism which identified sexuality with sin and radical sinfulness. 
One knows that the belief that Mary conceived Jesus without what was for centuries called the stain of carnal commerce. Now tell me that it does not disparage marital relations. It suits Gnostic ideals. Anthony Tomasco concurs when he notes that the perceived need for Mary's perpetual virginity seems to have been based on the antiquated notion that sexuality is somehow associated with sin. Contrary to the flyer that advertised this event, this has not been a debate involving the Catholic position versus the Protestant position. I think Mr. Magix will even agree on this. This has been instead a debate between the majority view of scholars, both Catholic and Protestant, versus the view of Mr. Magix. Indeed, if you've been paying close attention to my presentation, you've already noticed that virtually every scholar that I've quoted in support of my position is a Catholic scholar. Represented by such theological heavyweights as Raymond Brown, John McKenzie, Joseph Fitzmaier, John T. Meyer, Eugene Leverrier. Indeed, the view I have presented to you tonight is undeniably the majority view within Catholic New Testament scholarship. Mr. Matisic might contend that the majority of the Catholic scholars are liberal or moderate, and he's already done that. And their opinions on this issue are therefore to be rejected. But in doing so, Mr. Matisic would be engaging in private judgment. For Rome has not labeled these scholars as liberal. Maybe Mr. Matisic has, but Rome hasn't. Is Mr. Matisic the magisterium? As a matter of fact, Roman Catholic scholars such as Brown, Rahner, McKenzie, Meyer, Fitzmaier, and others are considered to be well within the pale of official Roman Catholic teaching and indeed are more representative of this teaching than are the conservatives who make up the minority position. Indeed, Raymond Brown, as I've mentioned before, has served on the Pontifical Biblical Commission twice under two different popes. All of these scholars are in good standing with Rome, and for good reason. They all believe in Mary's perpetual virginity as a legitimate teaching of the Church. But they are at least honest enough to admit that if one takes the New Testament documents at face value and reads them as historical documents, one must conclude that Mary had other children and that Jesus had biological brothers and sisters. Consequently, these scholars do not accept the historicity of the New Testament documents. But their rejection of the historicity of the New Testament documents cogently illustrates one cold, hard fact, namely that one cannot at the same time hold to the truthfulness of Rome's teaching regarding Mary's perpetual virginity and to the historicity and accuracy of the New Testament documents and to the words and phrases that are normally used since they are mutually exclusive propositions. These scholars have opted to believe Rome. That's where their allegiance lies. They've opted to believe Rome and reject the full inerrancy of the scriptures. Evangelicals have chosen to do the opposite. That Mary remained a virgin after the birth of Christ. And I've backed that up by evidence of the Greek text, Greek grammars, Greek lexicons, and the majority opinion of scholars on this issue. More importantly, I have been consistent with the plain, natural reading of the text. Ask yourself this question. How much of this has Mr. Matisic done? Has he given you the plain reading of the text, or is he asking you to accept convoluted interpretations of it? Has he proposed the plain meaning of words and phrases as they are normally used in this literature, or is he asking us to accept some exception to this rule? I submit that Mr. Magic has failed to provide us with anything to substantiate his beliefs except, of course, his own opinion. He has, by his own tacit admission, started with the belief that Mary is a perpetual virgin and then sought to vindicate that belief by imposing meanings on words and phrases that they never elsewhere have in the literature under consideration, the New Testament documents and the literature surrounding the New Testament. He has not given us an adequate explanation as to why we should abandon the plain meanings of these words and phrases that are customarily used in the New Testament times, and instead to adopt meanings for these words and phrases that have absolutely no support in the New Testament, nor in the literature contemporaneous to the New Testament documents. In doing so, Mr. Magic is guilty of what New Testament scholar D.A. Carson, who was my mentor, calls in his book, Exegetical Fallacies, the fallacy of semantic obsolescence. Semantic obsolescence is committed when the interpreter assigns to a word or a phrase a means that that word or phrase used to have in earlier times, but that is no longer found within the live semantic range of the word. Carson pro provides an example, the Greek word martus, from whence we get our word martyr. Martus used to bear the meaning one who gives evidence in or out of court, but soon came to mean one who dies for a cause, so that in its latter, latter stage of development it no longer bears the meaning that it used to. Mr. Matisic has committed the same fallacy in regard to the words autophos, brother, autophase, sister, and the phrase heosu, until, 
all of which used to bear the meanings Mr. Matisic needs to support his position, but none of which bear those meanings in the literature of the New Testament or in the surrounding literature. Let me see if I can illustrate the magnitude of that error. Some of you are familiar with the King James Version of the Bible, and if you have your Bibles, no matter what version, uh, you're invited to turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says, And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. For those of you who are familiar with the King James Version, you'll notice that verse 7 of this passage reads, For the mystery of iniquity doth work already, only he who now letteth will let until he is taken out of the way. The word let is used in this passage of the King James Version because when the King James Version was translated, one of the meanings of the word let was to hinder or forbid. Of course, we would never think of using the word let these days to convey the concept of prevention, since the word today almost exclusively means to allow. The exact opposite of what it meant when the King James translators translated this passage. But this does illustrate the magnitude of the error that Mr. Mattis is committing in his presentation. Let me explain. Suppose for the moment Mr. Mattis and his family are walking down Hamilton Avenue, just outside here. Uh, walking down Hamilton Avenue and he's taking his family home, it's getting late at night and he wants to get them back to the hotel. And out of nowhere, a man jumps out of the bushes and grabs Mrs. Matitix's purse and begins running. Now, Mr. Matitix, the brave, chivalrous man that he is, uh, decides to pursue the man. And he's running after him, and he notices in the distance there is another man walking toward both of them, and so he yells to the man, Stop him! He's a thief! So the man drops what he's doing, stops him, holds onto him, and Mr. Matitix uh, is kind of a slow runner, and so he's still about lagging behind about 50 yards or so, and he wants to make sure that the other man doesn't let him go. And so he's thinking in his mind of the options that, that he has for communicating this idea. And so he thinks, well, I could tell him, don't let him go. I could say, forbid him to go. Uh, but the, then Mr. Maddox just remembers that in the King James Version, the word let is sometimes used to mean to hinder or forbid. And so he yells to the man, let him go. What is that man going to do? Obviously, he's going to let him go, isn't he? And Mr. Matisic finally runs up and he's panting and under his breath, he, or once he catches his breath, rather, he, he finally asks the man, why did you release him? And the man said, well, because you told me to let him go. To which Mr. Matisic replies, you knave, don't you realize that the meaning to forbid or hinder is well within the semantic range of the word left? Folks, Mr. Maddox would not be so foolish or so careless as to use a word that would surely, at best, cause confusion, at worst, do, result in the exact opposite of what he went in to do. But folks, Mr. Maddox is asking us to believe that Matthew was that careless, that he was that sloppy in the words that he chose when he wrote Heosu, so that he used it in a way that means the exact opposite of what it always means everywhere else in the New Testament and in the two centuries surrounding the birth of Christ. He wants us to believe that the rest of the Gospel writers and Paul were that swapping careless in using the word autofe and autofos to mean something that it never means in any of the other literature. Most of you, I'm certain because you look like you know each other, are here as Roman Catholics. In fact, I'm not even sure there is a Protestant in this group. Um, is there? Just uh, raise the hand. Oh, there is one. Okay, good. The, uh, I don't feel so alone, but I'm sure you feel much more alone than you used to. Uh, if you're here as a Roman Catholic, I'd like you to ask yourself this question. Has your view been vindicated tonight? Are you comfortable with what you've heard in defense of the Roman Catholic position on this issue? If you are the least bit uncomfortable with what you've heard, and the very fact that Mr. Matrix has been unable to give you even one instance of these words, where they mean what they should mean in these passages, you very well should be. Then let me ask you to ask yourself this other question. How can Rome be so wrong on an issue that's so simple, so easily verified, so plainly laid out for us in the scriptures, so demonstrably at odds with the scriptures, how can Rome be so wrong and still command your allegiance? 
an issue can be so wrong on something that is so easily verified and so plainly laid out, what about all those other areas on which you command your fidelity that you can't verify, such as Mary's immaculate conception or the assumption of Mary? Well, just believe it. We've defined it as a dogma. There's 2,000 years of history behind it. You can trust us. But that's the point, isn't it? It's an issue of trust. You have to decide tonight whether you are going to continue to trust an institution that is so far off base that it can't even get it right on this one simple issue that is so plainly laid out for us in Scripture. In how many other areas has she misled you? Rome wants us to believe against all the evidence and against the plain reading of Scripture, against the philological evidence, the lexical evidence, and the exegetical evidence, that Mary was a perpetual virgin. I don't buy it, folks. I don't buy it. And neither should you. Thank you very much. I want to thank Mr. Svensson for <clears throat> being willing to come here this evening and do what is, I think, by any standard, from anyone's perspective, a difficult task. I do believe that this is probably the most um, substantial debate I've had um, with someone who specializes in, let's say, critiquing the Catholic position. And I want to thank him uh, for having approached it with the seriousness that it deserves. At the same time, I have to say that I think some misrepresentations have been made especially in this closing statement. Mr. Spenson has said that the debate tonight is really not between the Catholic and the Protestant position, but between the multitude of honest-minded scripture scholars and the idiosyncratic view of gerrymetrics. I think it's more politically advantageous to characterize what is going on tonight in that way. But if we're honest, the fact is that the view that Mr. Spenson rejects it's not the idiosyncratic view that Jerry Maddox seeks to foist upon the scripture. It is instead the dogmatic teaching of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It seems to me there was a little bit of equivocation there, even objectively, even if it wasn't intentional, uh, on Mr. Uh, Svensson's part. He quotes scholars saying, the Mary of pious legends, the Mary of the imagination, he quoted John L. McKenzie, is not the Mary of scripture. But the equivocation is that the implication is that the dogmatic teaching of the church, that Mary was a virgin before the birth of Jesus, during the birth, and after the birth of Jesus, that this is somehow that pious imagination. In other words, what is it that Mr. Svensson is really out to combat? Is he really merely seeking to try to dissuade some people of some, some overly fanciful imaginations about Mary? Or is he willing to admit that what he rejects is the solemn magisterial teaching of the Catholic Church? He has to declare himself on this point. I ask him whether he understands that the Church has solemnly defined, time after time, by Pope after Pope, by Council after Council, that Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Jesus. And again, all you have to do is pick up something like Ludwig Ott's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma and turn to the section on the virginity of Mary. And you can read quote after quote. If any man says, if any man denies that Mary was not uh, perpetually a virgin before, during, and after the birth of our Lord, let him be anathema. So that's the real target of Mr. Spenson's rhetoric. It's not people who haven't read enough scripture scholarship. It's people who believe what the magisterium of the Catholic Church teaches. And if that's the case, then quoting all the modern scripture scholars in the world is really not to the point. Because this is a confusion these scholars themselves fall into. Scholars do not make up the magisterium. It doesn't matter how many scholars you get to agree on something. Mr. Svensson, if he's going to make uh, at least a portion of his career out of critiquing Catholicism, needs to know, and I'm sure he does know, that the, what constitutes the magisterium of the Catholic Church. And it is not simply the consensus of scholars at a particular point in history. There is a discrepancy between what the Church solemnly teaches and what these scholars would have you believe. It's not that they're honest men, but they are people who have been Protestantized because of the ecumenism that runs rampant in our day that causes people to diminish 
and downplay the distinctives between the classical Catholic teaching and the Protestant teaching. What I would like to remind Mr. Svensson of, remind myself of, and remind everyone here of, is a very important statement that he cannot find fault with because it's found in the inspired scripture itself. In St. Peter's second epistle, in chapter 3, verse 16, he tells us that there are things in the scriptures that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable can distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, Mr. Svensson, by his very clever and, I have to admit, very entertaining analogy of the purse snatcher being chased by uh, the gallant Jerry Maddox, can say, come on, when you've got a critical situation, you're going to use clear, unambiguous language. And if Jerry Maddox said, let him go, then he would have been utterly irresponsible. And that is, by implication, Mr. Svensson says, what the Catholic Church claims about the writers of the New Testament that they used, that they somehow didn't, weren't guided by the Holy Spirit to use clear and ambiguous language if the Catholic Church is to be believed in its teaching on the Sabbath of of Mary. The problem is the analogy, like all the analogies Mr. Benson has used tonight, really falls to the ground. The word let, as he himself admitted, has changed its meaning to be the opposite of what it was before. Whereas now the word let means permit or allow, in King James English, as he cited from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in the King James Version of the Bible, let meant to, to prevent. So, of course, having a basic common sense knowledge of how the word has flip-flopped in meaning, I would know if I used the word let that the person might do exactly the opposite of what I want him to do and would have perhaps no one but myself to blame for his very understandable misunderstanding of my use of old King James English. That is not the case with Adel Foss, however. It is not that it has gone from one meaning to a meaning entirely the opposite, but that the word has always had a broader range of meaning as well as a narrower one. And this isn't unique to Adel Foss. This is true of many, many words in the Bible. It can have a broader generic meaning and a more restricted, a more uh, intense meaning. This is true of many words that Mr. Uh, Spencer and I would, would agree on if we were talking about the theology of the New Testament and talking about words like righteousness or words like uh, uh, cleanse or words like faith. We can use word, the word faith in a very broad sense and in a very strict theological sense. That's what I do. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I must have hit the stop. It's hard to I hit the stop button by accident. Yeah. <laughs> well, I heard the beep, so I caught myself. Adolf Foss was used in the Bible to mean, and Mr. Swenson has to admit this, and he has admitted it, in the Septuagint, it is a fact of history that someone can refer to someone else as his Adolf Foss, even though he is not his strict sibling. Abraham can address Lot as his Adolf Foss, and everyone knows and everyone admits that they were kinsmen, they were relatives, but they were not siblings. What Mr. Swenson wants you to believe tonight is that the word changed its meaning the way the word let changed its meaning in his analogy. So that it no longer means that broader sense of relative. It only means sibling in the New Testament. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We only have Mr. Svensson's word for it that the word did change its meaning. There is not a single Greek lexicon in existence. I've said it before and I'll repeat it. That says, not one written by a Protestant, or anybody that would not have an axe to grind in favor of the Catholic position that says, folks, Adel Foss, you know, as it gives the definition, in the old, in the Septuagint, means sometimes siblings, sometimes near kinsmen. In the New Testament, always means siblings from the same uterus. There is no lexicon that says what Mr. Spencer would like it to say. So that he could say, if there are brothers of Jesus, they must be children of Mary, because that's what the word has changed to mean by the time St. Matthew or St. Mark is using it. This is wishful thinking on his part. But there's no linguistic evidence. There's no lexical evidence. There's no scholar asserting in their actual dictionary that the word has narrowed or restricted itself in its meaning. That is a fact. Mr. Svensson might wish that the dictionary said that, but it in fact does not. That means that as we approach this issue, we have to be aware that we run the risk of misinterpreting. 
a word that can be used in one sense or another sense. And so we ask ourselves the very real question, how do we know we're interpreting this verse correctly? If Adelphos can mean a near kinsman, or in the stricter, narrower sense, a brother, how do we know how it's being used in St. Matthew 13.55? Mr. Svensson would like it to believe one thing. He uh, insinuates that I would like it to be something else. Mr. Svensson said in his closing statement that Jerry Matipik started with the belief in marriage of our divinity and then went to Scripture to twist the Scriptures to support that belief. But I would like to remind you this evening, and a remind Mr. Spencer something he knows well, that I didn't start with this belief. I wasn't raised a Catholic. I didn't start out with the full-blown belief that I must find evidence in the Scripture that marriage is perpetually a virgin. For 14 years, I preached against Catholicism as a grab bag of doctrines of demons and heresies and distortions of Scripture based upon the same types of arguments that Mr. Svensson has made tonight. And it was only after coming to grips with, number one, my own fallibility, and number two, the overwhelming awareness of the fact that the church to which the Bible came, the fact that the church which collected these books and canonized them and copied them over and over again in the Middle Ages, the church that seems to in some way not be threatened at all by all these verses which Mr. Svensson says spell the death of the Catholic position. If that's so, Mr. Svensson, why didn't the Catholic Church get rid of the Bible? Why didn't they change these verses? Why didn't they substitute some other word? They felt free to copy and recopy the very verses, the very Greek, that you feel spells the doom of Catholicism because they saw there's another way to interpret it than the way that you insist is the only legitimate way to interpret it. And I think it is the height of presumption for someone 2,000 years later to say that let us say, for the sake of argument, the vast majority and not the entirety. I haven't yet looked at this Irenaeus quote that he claims, because I have quotes from Irenaeus where he affirms the professional virginity of Mary. Let's say that I'll grant him that particular point, that Irenaeus said something inconsistent with what he said later on. But 99% of the church fathers, if he will not grant that it's 100%, said this, these verses have nothing to say that contradicts what we know to be a historical fact. We knew Mary. The apostles knew her. And she did not have other children. And we affirm the perpetual virginity of Mary in our creeds, in our liturgies, in our prayers. This is what the early church says. And now the early church say it. Not only did Pope after Pope and Council after Council reaffirm this, but as I said, even Protestant reformers like Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli uh, affirmed this very same thing. Luther always defended Our Lady's virginity. This is a direct quote from um, a book called Our Lady and the Protestants in Jennifer Carroll's Mariology, Volume 3. Before, during, and after the birth of our Lord, he denied that she had other children, condemned Helvidius, the heretic that Jerome wrote his masterful uh, defense, who taught otherwise. By the way, uh, I think, again, there was a, perhaps a misunderstanding, and I will be willing to take the blame for it, in Mr. Svensson's opening statements. All I said to him on the phone four or five weeks ago was that I had not at that point read St. Jerome's defense of the professional virginity of Mary in its entirety against Helvidius, uh, so that I was not aware of the passages in which he talked about whether these children were children of Joseph by a previous marriage. I never said that there were two uh, equally valid Catholic positions uh, on this point, or that there is no Catholic position, therefore. Calvin taught the same thing, her professional virginity. And you can read this again in any historical survey of Calvin's teaching about Mary. Same with Heinrich Bullinger uh, and other Protestant reformers. They read the same Bible that Mr. Svensson reads tonight, and they didn't see in it the arguments that he sees that make the perpetual virginity of Mary impossible. These are the arguments that Mr. Svensson sees refute the virginity of Mary, the perpetual virginity of Mary. And yet we've seen that Protestants, on every single one of these, say that they are inconclusive. We saw that, um, that um, uh, Henry Alford's Greek New Testament. We saw that Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich, uh, a Protestant lexicon, says about the word um, uh, sunerkamai, that coming together doesn't have to have that sexual connotation in the papyri of the period. Mr. Sensen wants to talk about contemporary accounts. It simply means to marry. You can look that up for yourself in Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich. I have the, uh, the, the photocopy right here. These arguments are inconclusive against the virginity of Mary, which the Church has consistently affirmed for 2,000 years, 
and nobody, neither Mrs. Svensson nor anybody else, has given us irrefutable evidence against. I believe, since the Bible speaks of Mary as virgin, since the church honors her as virgin, since the creed speaks of her as virgin, since that is her role and her place down in the development of the theology of the church, the burden of proof is on someone to say she is not a virgin her whole life because here is where she lost her virginity. And that proof is not present. There is no proof that causes us to say, here's what we must affirm that Mary lost her virginity. None of these things add up to it, nor does anything else that Mr. Uh, Spencer has said tonight. We have the desire of fallible individuals to teach that Mary lost her virginity, but we have nothing remotely as weighty as the evidence of the church fathers and the constitution of the church that says the opposite. Thank you very much. Please give these gentlemen a hand. Okay, it's very late. Just wait a moment. It's very late, but we're going to have a question and answer period. Um, and we can start that any time. And also, um, you know, if you don't have a legitimate question, don't come up. <laughs> How's that? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right here. You can come up to here and talk to the mic. Um, theology and so on. I may be completely off, but it seems to me I recollect reading St. Ignatius of Antioch, right, is the fellow about the time of Trajan, about 120, who goes on this journey towards Rome writing letters. Do I got that right? <laughs> yes. So uh, St. Ign Ignatius of Antioch, therefore, presumably, and I've read this, was actually had met either apostles or guys who had known the apostles. Yes. And you're saying that St. Ignatius of Antioch specifically depends the virginity of Mary. Yes. So it seems to me that, I mean, in historical terms, I'm not going to argue about the philological stuff, that it would be lovely if we could find somebody who specifically said, for example, well, Mary was always a virgin, she never had any children except him. Or, and Mary other had, you know, 12 other children. That would be really nice if we'd have a definitive statement. Well, so, but if she did, then they would have had children, and everyone would have known them, right? Because after all, Jesus was a pretty notable guy. So they just say, oh, this is, this is Mary, this is his grandchild. And Ignatius would have known about that too because he knew those guys and he wouldn't have defended the virginity of Mary. I don't see, I mean, he's a kind of a historical witness then, isn't he? That's my question. Who, who, who's that question too, by the way? I don't care. Uh, uh, let's go with Eric first for 30 seconds and, and Jerry for 30 seconds. Well, again, the, the, the perpetual virginity of Mary emerged um, first in the fourth century. That's when that's when they started uh, debating whether or not, you know, and Jerome and Helvidius debating whether or not Mary was a virgin perpetually, and trying to come up with some theories on supporting that view. But before that, you don't really find anybody that's all that interested. And so it's really, again, it's it's not the the purpose of of those writers to defend that view because it wasn't it wasn't an issue back then. My only response to that would be that, according to Mr. Svensson's own view, these literal brothers of Jesus in the strict sense become leaders of the church later on. James, the brother of our, the Lord, is the Bishop of Jerusalem. And, and it just seems amazing, incredible, that the doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity would have arisen if everybody said, wait a minute, all these bishops we had, all these leaders in the church, we know that they were the children of Mary. How can we get away with pulling a rabbit out of a hat by claiming that Mary was perpetually a virgin? In fact, we, only, we also know about James, the brother of the Lord, if we interpret that phrase in the strict sense which Mr. Benson wants us to, that from, we know from Josephus' book, The Jewish War, that when James, the brother of the Lord, was put to death by a mob of the Jews who threw him off a parapet of the temple in the 60s, during the revolt against Rome from 66 to 70 AD, we know that he was an aged man in his 80s. Now, you can stop and do the math for yourself. I haven't, I, I haven't slept for two days since I've been traveling here, but even I can figure out that if James is the brother of the Lord and he was in his 80s when he was put to death in the 60s AD, then he had to be uh, a child of Mary, according to Mr. Benson's logic, before Mary was even born. But at least he had to be older than Jesus. And therefore, Jesus would not be the firstborn. The math would require you, if James is the brother of the Lord, and he's in his 80s when he's put to death, 
And brother of the Lord means son of Mary. That Mary was having children long before she had Jesus, and so in what sense is he the firstborn at all? And even Mrs. Fenton doesn't believe that he wasn't the firstborn in the sense of Mary had children before him, because he believes, as I asked him, that Mary was a virgin until she gave birth, until after she gave birth to Jesus. So I think the evidence of history is against us interpreting these brothers of the Lord in that way. Jerry, can you produce that quote from Josephus? What is the citation there? Uh, I don't have my copy of Josephus, and, because you quoted that in your in your debate with James White too, and you didn't you didn't quote the citation there. I looked that up, and uh, the only citation that Josephus has for James the brother of the Lord is not in Jewish Wars, as you alluded to in that debate. I'm not sure what you said this time. But in, 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 in antiquities, antiquities. in antiquities, it does not mention any age. It does recount the death of James, but there is no age mentioned. Okay. You keep mentioning this 89 years old. That just doesn't exist. Well. I'll be willing to stand. I'll be willing to retract. I, I would like to see that. I'd be willing to retract. Right. Right. I'll be willing to retract my statement if we find that it doesn't exist. But it's, in, it's in chapter 20 of Antiquity. But nobody That's has. Helpful. But nobody has challenged the statement before when it's been made. So all I'm saying, if I'm being honest, I'd like to see it. If what your point would be valid if you said, "Hey, James White challenged you on that two years ago." No, he you, didn't challenge you. Exactly. You said it in your closing statement. How? Here's, this is the first time anyone I've ever heard anyone challenge that there is no such statement. I'd like you to produce it before you go on to your next debate. If I <laughs> knew, if I knew that, if I had known you were going to challenge it, I would have had the, the copy here. That's all I'm saying. This is a novelty. I've never heard right. anyone deny that there is such a statement. So I'm willing to do the work. I'm personally inviting you to send me that reference. Very good. I'm personally responding. Thank you. <laughs> See, we have a personal relationship here. I have a question for Mr. Swenson on the length of the tradition he's following. Does it go back to his mentor? Does it go back to the invention of the personal computer? Does it go back to Boltzmann? Does it go back to the higher criticism in Germany beginning in the first half of the 19th century? And why, if he will not even accept Luther, Calvin, or Zwingli, who could he come up with in the 16th century other than a wacky Anabaptist who would have the same view of what we know as objective truth. You have said truth can be known, but you seem to imply that truth has either remained hidden till the modern age or is up for grabs only by certain gifted individuals. No, that's, uh, that's a misrepresentation of what I said. What I said was that, in fact, uh, Mr. Magic has confused theology with philolo- uh, philology. Philology is the study of words. Uh, lexicology is, is also the study of words. What we do uh, is this is this is completely outside of the realm of biblical studies. This is Greek words. These are Greek words. We we find out what their normal usage is, what the normal means are, um, based on usage. And so when we go to a certain era, and, and Mr. Mattis again misrepresented the word let. I did not say it changed uh, to uh, to the opposite of what it was before. It still meant in King James times to allow, but one of the meanings was to hinder or forbid. It lost in the same way. Phrases like has a school, lost the meaning that it used to have. It retains some of that meaning. You can still find that Othu, meaning what it does in the New Testament, in the Septuagint. You can still find uh, uh, some nuances of the word autophos uh, in the New Testament that were existed in the Septuagint. You know, obviously brother. But this is a different study than theology. And all I'm bringing out is the, the normal meanings of the words based on customary usage. Mr. Magnus doesn't have that evidence. Well, ma'am, um, the Jews made a similar claim at the time of Jesus. But if you trace back when the apostasy happens in the Old Testament, you'll find that it was in the generation right after Moses and Joshua. Moses, Aaron, and Joshua. After that, it degenerated. And they thought they had the truth for thousands of years. And when Jesus came and seen, they were quite surprised they didn't. In fact, they were, they, they were certain they didn't. So it, it's not surprising that there would be an apostasy that soon after the apostles left the scene. There was the same apostasy after Joshua left the scene in the very next generation. Look it up, read it, you'll see there's a, a degenerating spiral after that point. I'd like just to have a one-sentence response to, to her question uh, about the lineage of those who hold Mr. Spencer's position. And I'm simply going to quote from Math- uh, Father Matthias Shaven's book on Mariology. On page 111, he says this, and again, if Mr. Spencer wants to contest this, historically, he can. But Father Shaben, who is an expert on Mariology, says this, quote, Mary's perpetual divinity, excuse me, perpetual virginity, now I think you were right the first time. The word divinity is right underneath it in the line, so I made an error in, in reading here because it comes up in the next page. Mary's perpetual virginity was denied only by those heretics who also denied the divinity of Christ, such as the Ebionites, Arians, 
Tertullian, and rationalist Protestants, or by those who display a great wantonness in the domain of morals, such as Helvidius and Jovinianus. And Tertullian would fall, if you'd let me finish the sentence, into that second. Did uh, he deny the, the deity of Christ? Sorry? Did Tertullian deny the deity of Christ? I said, let me finish the sentence. There were two errors into which people fell. One was a problem in the area of morals, which the Montanists fell into. One was a problem in the area of, of Christology. Tertullian was not guilty of the first, but he was of the second. Yeah, I see your quote now. Yes, uh, I didn't want to come to this debate tonight. I thought, what a boring topic. But uh, one, of the, one of the ladies that I went out to dinner with was driving, and it was too far to walk home. So, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I thought, uh, what great practical difference does it have to me whether Mary was a virgin or not? Mm -hmm. uh, aside from the fact that uh, the search for truth is always valuable, especially when it's regard to the life of Jesus and his mother. Uh, I think both of um, what, what relevance does it have? Um, the only relevance that it has to me, because well, I, I, I can only speak from, per, from personal experience and, and my own personal thoughts, uh, the relevance it has to me is that if it, it comes down to, a, to authority, if Rome is wrong on this, then she can be wrong on some other things too. And other than that, whether or not Mary was a perpetual virgin has no bearing to me on any other doctrine. But it seems to be an all-encompassing doctrine within Roman Catholicism. And so uh, if we can show that it is not true based on the, the lexical evidence the normal uses of words, again, the philological evidence, if we can show that it's not true, then it opens the door for at least investigating other things that may not be true. My answer to the question would be that, as you pointed out so well, and I didn't have time to in my presentation, the virginity of Mary that is taught by the Church and its magisterial teachings goes beyond just her mere physical integrity of her body, her physical virginity. It talks about that complete giving of herself to God, that spiritual and mental virginity that you were referring to, and it reminds us, as wonderful as the married life is, as wonderful as sexual love within that context of permanent commitment is, that there is a higher way, that our Lord lived a life of celibacy, that he called the apostles, uh, and eventually uh, the understanding of this grew and developed in the church. Uh, even St. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 7, a chapter that Mr. Spencer referred to, tells us that there is a higher way. There's a, there's a, there's, even though marriage is a beautiful thing and a holy thing, and in fact, there is no um, Protestant church that I'm aware of that exalts marriage to the level of a sacrament, as the Catholic Church does. So I take great exception to the insinuation that the Catholic Church feels that somehow sex is dirty, and so that's why they had to foist perpetual virginity upon Mary as a way of expressing some Gnostic agenda. The Catholic Church has the highest possible view of sex. It's the one that's the most pro-life, the one that condemns the contraceptive mentality. It says sex is beautiful, we should be open to life, we should have, be fruitful, multiply, marriage is indissoluble to death of its part. And yet, having said all those things more courageously than any Protestant church I'm aware of says, and yet, behold, celibacy is a higher way. And Our Lady reminds us of that, something that we will all be in heaven, not marrying or giving in marriage. Gary Reed designed that for centuries, uh, the use of the phrase that Mary uh, conceived Jesus without uh, the stain of carnal commerce. Do you deny the use of that phrase? No, I don't deny that. I, it's still relevant stain today. Of, the stain of carnal commerce, Jerry, it's still relevant today. That is uplifting and exalting the sexual relations within marriage. Is that what you're saying? Pointing out that because you, you made the statement that there's no connection between sex and sin. And of course there is. That's how original sin is propagated. Of course. Our sexual, there is no, there is no sin within married sex, is what I'm saying. There certainly can be. There's concupiscence, Mr. Svensson. And it would be an extraordinary grace for someone to be able to engage in the sexual dimension of their life. Like, in, the stain of carnal commerce refers to the simple act of sexual intercourse. Are you saying oh, that is a stain of carnal commerce? Sex isn't intrinsically evil, but it is as open to being tainted by, by sin as any aspect of our life is. But, but, Carnal commerce is called a stain in relation to... No, it's simple, not a, it's no. simple 
uh, sexual intercourse. You're misinterpreting the phrase. So maybe you're not holding to the, the faith of old after all, Jerry. You're misinterpreting the phrase. Maybe you're interpreting it. Sex isn't called sex. Well, the subject, gentlemen. <laughs> and the line has grown. It's just, you referred earlier to the brothers, I don't know theology that well, but you were talking about the four brothers of Christ and that it wasn't until the Pentecost that the truth was revealed to them that he was God, their brother, Jesus? No, not Pentecost, the resurrection. Okay, so they've been living with their brother, Jesus, right, all these years, and they don't know that he's God? Mm -hmm. They don't know that he hasn't committed a sin all this time they've been living with him, mm -hmm. right? right? They don't, they, you're, you're saying that these... They, they knew what he claimed. They didn't believe him. It says in John 6, or John 9, even his brothers did not believe in him. They mocked him. So it's it's obvious if he's going to claim to be God, he's not going to uh, he's not going to convince them that they're a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So they're not about to believe him until they see proof, and that proof happened at the re resurrection. Well, I, I think the lady's point is that this seems very hard to imagine if, in fact, these are men who have grown up in the same house as our Lord and, and can't see that he has lived a sinless life. What I think the lady is saying is it's more credible to say that these people didn't discern his divinity if they are our relatives, but not people who had the intimate um, daily exposure to our Lord that they would, would have had as siblings if indeed that is, if your contention is correct. But if these, if these uh, relatives are accompanying Mary almost everywhere she goes, and obviously they were a lot closer than what you're inferring. Well, first of all, that, that's, that's a uh, gratuitous statement on your part, that she's, they're always accompanying Mary everywhere she goes. So I don't know where says that. Well, it certainly does in, in Mark 3. It has them going to get Jesus because they thought he was out of his mind. Right, but Mr. Stinson, I mean, let's, let's be fair. They, you say that these brothers, Jesus, whatever they are, are accompanying Mary on this case, and, and in a couple of other instances, too. Now you're reading to the Bible and saying, well, that means they must have went with her everywhere she went. No, I'm not saying they went with her everywhere she went, but we, we do see them in the same context in a lot of places. So there, there must have been some uh, more intimate than these. I mean, you're, you're saying on the one hand that these were close relatives. You're saying on the other hand that they were not so close because they couldn't observe uh, Jesus' life. So which is it? Well, <laughs> the, hold on. I've got a question. Okay. For Eric. Yeah. If, uh, if the Blessed Virgin received the message, okay, from the angel that told her that this was the Son of God, she didn't reveal this to any of her children, and so therefore they didn't know? Well, there is, there, there is, is a lot of evidence in the New Testament that Mary herself did not fully understand what that, all that meant, because she pondered these things in her heart. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me. Let me answer the question. This is not a debate where the debate's done. This is a question and answer period. There is a lot, there is a lot of evidence in the New Testament that suggests that Mary misunderstood the mission of Jesus. That's why, for instance, in, in uh, John 2, um, uh, Jesus has to distance her, himself from her by saying, what do we have to do with each other, woman? And, and uh, that's why he suffers biological ties. That's why Mary is in the company of the brothers who go get him because he's out of his mind. So there is a lot of evidence that would suggest you know, just opposite of that. My response would be there is no statement in the scriptures which suggests that Mary did not understand the mission of her son. There is no statement in the scripture that says that. And the statement of our Lord to his mother in John 2, 4, which Richard Benson just cited, what is that to thee and to me, was a test of her perception of what sort of claim she in fact did have over him. As Mr. Svensson himself points out, it's the same construction the demons use when they say, what have you to do with us, son of the most high God, when Jesus confronts the demon-possessed men in the Gadarenes in Mark chapter 8. They were saying to him, what claim do you have over us? He didn't say, gee, I guess I have none. I'll leave you alone. He showed that even though it wasn't the appointed hour, the end of time, he could still have a proleptic judgment. He could have an anticipation judgment. He had some authority over them now. Even though his hour to die on the cross had not yet come, Mary had a legitimate claim over him, and so he acted out in a symbolic fashion what he would do literally on the cross and provide the wine uh, of his precious blood. Excuse me, Luke chapter 2, verse, four, verse uh, 48. And when they saw him, Mary and Joseph, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? And they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. 
But that's not a far cry from saying she didn't understand his divine mission. Obviously, if she didn't, if he didn't, under, if she didn't understand that he had to be in, in his father's house, he doesn't, she doesn't understand all that implies, and that's all I said. I'm not saying she did, was unaware of it. She did not understand all it implies. Of course, God's words are, are something that we have to spend a lifetime growing in our understanding and awareness of. But that's all I'm saying, Jerry. Yeah, but that, the church... That, that, but then you're not arguing... You're, you're not arguing saying, there was no statement that says she did not understand his mission. No. This is part of his mission, and she didn't understand it. No, the church doesn't claim that Mary had a perfect and complete... that she didn't ever go any, through any growth in her understanding of who Christ was. not saying the church did, but that's what the questioner asked. Okay. I'm confused a little bit. Are we saying that, uh, well, first of all, the, the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in the womb of Mary. Is that true? Okay, now, are we saying the Holy Spirit was in an, uh, an adulterous relationship with Mary because she was married to Joseph? Yeah. Why? Adultery has not to do with pregnancy, but sexual relations. Did the, are you suggesting the Holy Spirit had sexual, sexual relations with Mary? My, my view would be that God, as, as Peter says in like Ephesians 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God is always going to lead us onwards and upwards, the higher and higher levels of spirituality. To me, it is unthinkable, and I think to the logic of Scripture, that God would call Mary to this very high, unique vocation among all the women in the world to be the mother of God incarnate, to have this exclusive relationship with God, to be fruitful while still being virginal, and then, as Mr. Svensson said, give her no future significant role to simply drop her and say, there, just have a normal human marriage, have produce sinful children, and they would to fall down to that level. God would take her to ever and higher and higher levels of deeper and total exclusive consecration to him, not, not to, to, to slide down the mountain from that. You know, the, this idea of, the, uh, of being anticlimactic um, can also be applied to Revelation, Jerry. Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the quintessential Word of God, came and gave his Word, and then you'd think that'd be it. History would be over, the revelation, the quintessential revelation of God has been given, but then we have Revelation written after that, through the apostles, which would be anticlimactic. No, but that doesn't make it not true. It's not anticlimactic in the sense that that, uh, Jesus is not writing it, the apostles are. That's not the biblical way of thinking. Christ says, I have more things to reveal to you that you can't even bear now. Yeah, so they're greater. He says, the greater things will you do. It's not anticlimactic. I agree with that, but one could make the case that it's anticlimactic in the same way that you just made the case, that it must be anticlimactic for Mary to have other children. What I'm saying is, uh, the New Testament does give us evidence that there are other children, so in the same way that it's not anticlimactic for Scripture to be written, Arguing in a it's circle. also not anticlimactic for uh, Mary to have other children. Vincent, if someone has God as a child and he's holy, and after that has children who are not God and are sinful, are you going to tell us that that is not anticlimactic? That, that assumes that God is concerned about whether or not that would be anticlimactic for Mary. That just assumes that play a role in the New Testament for Mary that she doesn't possess. It's objectively true that it's, that, that it's a lesser grade of child. It might be, but it, it doesn't matter because it would only be anticlimactic for Mary. It wouldn't be anticlimactic for God. And you're assuming, you're assuming that God is concerned that Mary might have an anticlimactic life. 